Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Gifford? Here. Mr. Jessick? Mr. LaSalle? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. McEnroth? Here. Mr. Mahoney? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. The okay, next thing is uh, approval of the minutes. Any corrections or? Good to me, I move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, agenda analysis, anything to add to it? I think, did you, Blair, want to put something onto it? Um, well, we, I don't know if it was added or not, but you know, we can chat about that. And sure. The, uh, the, are you talking about the Clackamas Cove Triathlon or the um, video? Um, both. Okay. That's fine. So there's, there was two items, Steve, I think that we would want to ch add to the agenda and one is about the triathlon the, um, and the the Oregon City uh, triathlon second annual um, and then the other item is uh, a video that Blaine has shared are we gonna have it queued up and it's, it's all ready to go okay yeah. so we'll get to watch a little video okay I have an item sure <coughs> at the uh, Planning Commission level uh, last uh, meeting we uh, approved the subdivision up near the Holcomb uh, Elementary School and uh, one of the streets is going to come out near uh, near the school near a dedicated right-of-way uh, near Holcomb and a question came up as to whether or not they had a 20 mile uh, reduced speed there by the high school uh, by the school mm -hmm. I think I brought that up and uh, the question the answer was no and the question was why <laughs> And whether or not we can put that on the agenda for discussion and see if we can get something like that going for that school up there because that's a dangerous uh, uh, set of circumstances that we're left with with that uh, with that curve up there and that new uh, increased volume of traffic coming out at that uh, at that uh, driveway entrance going in there. So so I've I've got that on the um, public works director's report and. Um, I didn't go do much research, but I remember a little bit about what um, history we've had about that school zone. And I don't know if others of you will remember that as well, but we've had some discussion about that school zone in the past. So we'll, we'll talk through that. Okay, uh, this is a, an additional 30, almost 30 homes that are going <coughs> to potentially exit right there by that driveway and that curve. So that, that'd be a welcome addition, I think, to discuss. Mr. Chair, um, yeah. I just took off from the High Cliff restaurant um, and was going to go around the block to this meeting. And guess what I saw? Flashing lights, flashing lights right there at the uh, <laughs> crossing uh, across 7th. So I don't know if you're going to talk about that, but that was pretty cool. Yeah, I was saying that was up. Okay, anything else? Uh, citizen uh, comment, Louisa. That's you? Yeah. Step forward to the. Yes. I hope that mic is on. I can't see. It is red. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. My name is Louisa Ganyu, and my husband Bill and I live in Oregon City. My concern is the, tra the speed of traffic on Center Street. We moved here three and a half years ago and thought we were moving into a residential area. <clears throat> I feel as if the amount of traffic has increased and the speed of traffic has increased. People are driving much faster than the 25 mile per hour speed limit. Going southeast on center from 7th, there's a stop sign at 5th Street. The next stop sign is at Kanema Road, which is Hilltop. That's 1.3 miles between stop signs. How is traffic going to be controlled in this growing town? The way it stands now, it's pretty much a free-for-all on <coughs> Center Street. Traffic is noisy. Uh, I've looked at speed bump information. Uh, they have speed cushions now that are spaced. They're smaller speed bumps and they're spaced so that an emergency vehicle can go drive on the street without going on the bumps. But there's, they supposedly slow traffic down between 15 and 20 miles per hour as they ride over them. 
So I wonder if the Transportation Advisory Committee would be willing to do a traffic study, research and possibly install speed cushions, install another stop sign, recommend police presence, or use radar speed signs. Thank you for listening. Okay. You have anything to add, John, or say anything? Uh, no, I just appreciate you coming and sharing that. I think th this is the right place to bring that sure. kind of uh, comment. And um, we do have some data available for uh, speeds that we, um, we, we get speed data for various roadways, and that's one that we actually have some data on. So we, we can take a look at that in detail and bring that back to you next week. I think um, the city also has speed, what we call speed hump um, policy on, on that this committee actually developed years ago. Um, Center Street, I'm not sure it qualifies for that because the volume of traffic on that roadway. and um, But things like radar signs and speed signs that tell you the speed that you're traveling, those are those have been solutions that we've been able to kind of use to help inform the driver as to what their speeds are. Um, so I think the best opportunity would be for us. We heard we've heard that we know a little bit about what your concerns are, and we'll the idea would be to bring those back to you next week, and month. unless you next or month. next month. month, actually, two months. We got a, Yeah, we got a question about meeting time, so we need to figure out when our next meeting is and it we usually take a break during the summertime so I know you have one <coughs> sign electronic sign on Center Street uh, just up one block up on High Street on High, high Street, street. Yeah, it's High Street isn't it yeah. Yeah. that's one of the speed reports that you guys have in your packet today that's that was gonna be my question is uh, something similar to this could be provided I'm sure for if we had a similar device we have to deploy a device there, and we currently don't have anything if, mounted. I say, if we had something similar to that on Center Street, we could provide statistics like these. The question that I had is, what's the what's the differentiation between Center Street and High Street insofar as its arterial status? Which is there a preferred route? Um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, aren't they pretty much the same capacity? Yeah, there's higher volumes on High Street than there is on Center Street. Uh, road classification, I'd have to look at the TSP. I know High um, High Street's an arterial, but I'm not sure about Center Street. It may be a neighborhood collector. Um, and so what is the difference between a neighborhood collector and an arterial? Well, in this case, they're, they've been long since established roadways, so the road section isn't much different. Um, Typically, that's the difference is you've uh -huh. got a road section. In a lot of Oregon City, there's road classifications out there that are based more on the kind of the volume of traffic and how they actually function versus what they were built, the standard they were built to. Um, so they're old enough streets to where we wouldn't necessarily build an arterial street standard for high street. I'm just wondering if the classification qualified a street for a different uh, level of service or um, attention. Yeah, signage, things like that. Um, boy, uh, n I don't believe they do, William. I don't believe okay. our street classification necessarily indicates that we would have, say, if it's an arterial, we would have uh, more signage more often. Uh, and in Center Street, the challenge with Center Street, and especially when we're talking stop signs or more stop signs, is that Really, there's not the demand on the side streets for stop signs. So stop signs have to meet warrants before we would put them in, typically. Uh, we do have some neighborhood stop signs where we've allowed them if uh, it's a particular kind of street, um, you know, that, that the through traffic is on versus the side traffic. But uh, the, uh, the classification of the roadway doesn't necessarily um, change okay. much in terms of signage or striping or anything like that. <coughs> Go ahead. Sure. Yep. Step up to the use the microphone, please. We drove a little bit in Portland today, and not only do they have stop signs in residential neighborhoods, but they have speed bumps in residential neighborhoods. So I, can't, I don't can't quite figure out living in a residential neighborhood where the speed limit is 25 miles per hour 
how cars can fly by at 35 or 40 miles an hour. And, the, and as I said, it's like a free for all. It's like these cars are whizzing by mm -hmm. and no, there's nothing to stop them. We've been trying for to figure- 1.3 miles. We've been trying to figure that out for years. You know, so, ir ir it's just irresponsible driving is. Well, so what do you do about it? maybe give a ticket now and then? A police <coughs> presence might help. Um, something to slow people down. Yeah. Yeah. If there's sure. nothing between 5th Street and 1.3 miles on Kanema Road, which is up the hill, it, you know, there's nothing to slow anyone down. A, a question? Yes. Whereabouts do you actually live? I live at 101 Center Street at 1st and Center. Okay. Yeah. Which so, first? <laughs> which first? First or South? South just first regular or first. first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just regular First Street. So I mean, I mean to me, the I think they're all good points. I just I think we should probably take a little bit of time to before we go too deep into a response. But I have been hearing better uh, feedback from our police chief, our new police chief, about his willingness to send patrols to speeding complaints. So um, I think. I think bringing it to this body is very helpful and it'll bring some more attention to that. And that's one of the early things that we can do is just share that concern with our police department. I did have a question for you, John, if it's okay. Um, the, I've been helping a friend do property management out near Lloyd Center. And so I noticed on 22nd, um, they have these smaller, I don't know what the technical name is, but they're roundabouts, but they're small. And they have plants in them and everything like that. And, so in addition to an occasional hump, but mostly it's the at least two or three of those. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, for me anyway, it sure slows me down. <laughs> I mean, I, those are traffic circles, mm -hmm. and um, they're not a roundabout, so don't confuse the two. They're basically traffic, traffic circles. Circle. Mm -hmm. And they usually put them at um, entrances into a neighborhood where, you know, it's not an arterial, but it's a neighborhood street that gets tends to have gotten a lot of cut through traffic in the past and um, they're precariously located at, at the appropriate locations and yeah it kind of requires you to actually slow down and maneuver around that circle um, the speed humps are another um, option that uh, you're right other cities have uh, you know Beaverton City of Portland their um, policy on installation of those is um, different than ours I don't necessarily say uh, theirs is right and ours is wrong. I would just say that they they seem more willing to put those in than our community has been. Our policy calls for certain warrants, and we that policy, by the way, is online for for you to read. It sounds like maybe you haven't seen our speed hump policy, but um, I think you should take a look at it. It 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 does make the speed hump requirements fairly rigid, and it requires the neighborhood to fund those they're fairly expensive as well between the signage the striping and the and the asphalt itself to build them so those are all good options it's just um, right I think you know again it'd be good for us to kind of think about this one a little bit before we come back with a response uh, an official kind of response yeah, John cool. given the nature of the request it'd probably be useful to have a compare and contrast with High Street then because that's what the neighbors are looking at. So if you give us the designation of the type of street and why the signage is the way it is, and maybe it's just historical happenstance, I don't know, but and when you use a different signage so we can kind of get up to speed ourselves, well, why is it A and B is different when they look the same? Um, the signage on, I'm not sure, yeah, the signage on High Street and Center Street is different. Today, but I'm okay. just saying that's, okay. that was the example. I know we put in, we put in a, a, a speed sign a location where we, you know, we rotate them around the city from, there is two locations on High Street, in each, one in each direction. That came from a crest through the McLaughlin mm -hmm. neighborhood. Um, so that's how, that, that specific sign was came came about um, and it may make sense to add one on sounds like it might make sense to add another uh, rotation to our mobile speed signs um, along Center Street as well 
John, it might, might it not be appropriate to advise the <coughs> uh, Chief of Police that uh, this has come before the Traffic uh, Advisory Commission and uh, Committee and, and for him to just be aware of it and look into it if he's, if he's uh, able to do so. And I, I realize it's resources and availability of manpower and, and that kind of stuff, you know, that, that all goes into the mix. I agree. I agree yeah. that would be. I think we can do that. I know we can do that pretty easily. Yeah. And like I said, he has been more open to that than what we've kind of received in the past. So I think that's great. Well, once in a while, a ticket given, and, a, <laughs> and you know, and the public goes by and say, "Wow," <laughs> you know, just a just a little message. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Bob. John. Are there any speed circles in Oregon City now? Glen Oak. Uh, well. Yeah, Glen Oak's close. You know, on Glen Oak Road between 213 and, and High School Lane, there is something similar to a, a circle. I'm trying to think. You uh, might give us some information about those when you come back to us. You're getting all this for me, right? Go <laughs> 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 for Martin. <laughs> I'm counting signs right now in the GIS. Martin needs to get his mic closer to him. I thought smartphones took care of all this stuff for us. <laughs> Not quite there yet. Um, we do have a sign inventory. I'm just kind of looking through the high street. Um, in terms of road classifications, and all of this information is available for you online on our um, mapping portal. Um, and if you'd like, you can have my business card um, before you leave, and I can walk you through all of that. So it sounds like you've done a lot of the research, but we can help you with a little bit more. And we'll prepare a formal report for you guys when you next time we decide to have a meeting, whether it's next month or subsequently. Um, the classification for High Street is slightly different than the road classification for Center Street. Okay, so that there are two clear distinctions. High Street does uh, bear quite a bit of bus traffic as well, which is also one of the main distinctions as to why it has a higher classification. Um, we do have some speed reports for portions of um, Center Street. Um, primarily the areas that you're concerned and some of the adjacent legs. Um, I will take a look at those and I'll compile those and put those into the report and give you guys an idea of um, where they fall in terms of um, meeting the 85th percentile rule for whether the speed limit is, is posted appropriately. So that's all information that we'll compile for you. Whether we meet next month or not, I'll try and put it all together within the next 30 days and at least get it to you if we do not have a um, meeting within the next 30, um, 30 days. And what we can do is I'll make two requests to the PD. One is for some additional enforcement, and they do have a portable trailer with a speed sign that we'll be happy to place in front of the operations facility. Hmm. Unfortunately, we have a stop sign as you're coming directly downhill, so you're not really going to catch it, but we'll pick an appropriate location. I know somebody else that lives on Center Street that might be able to put it in front of their house. Mm -hmm. um, but we can stage that um, until we can try and figure out, figure out a, a, a formal location for a permanent speed sign or putting one in our rotation. We do have a list of other locations that have asked for, you know, we want to rate our speed sign here. So um, just because you come to TAC, and just because you live on the same street as us, mm -hmm. you know, I've got to take all those things in consideration as to where we're going to put our next speed sign. But I'll, I'll, we'll put some stuff together and get it back to you in the next 30 days. Okay? Lisa, you got everything that I promised here? Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it's you coming to the committee. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming by. Is uh, the traffic nice advisory by the way. Uh, membership full? Do we have a, an empty seat? For this lady? <laughs> <laughs> we are full right now, but uh, keep an eye out for okay. us. We might have a vacancy. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> new business Clackamas County presentation on road maintenance fund. So, so Mike Besner's going to, Mike Besner's with the county, so he's going to go through this presentation. And, and I need a microphone. Uh, it's right in front of you. You're standing in front of right, Then I gotta sit. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Are you guys gonna be able to see this? Yes. yes. They all have monitors directly in wow. front of them. It's good. Just like Your mic is on. It's on. Right, thanks. So I'm Mike Besner with um, Clackamas County's engineering manager. I worked with Henry 15 years ago on the Anchorway Bridge. You might not remember. 
Oh, I remember. Um, uh, so I was asked to come here and talk about the funding effort we currently have underway at the county. And so this is the pr same presentation we've been giving to a lot of members of the public, been going to a lot of CPOs, community planning organizations, Rotaries, Kiwanis, Chambers of Commerce, et cetera. CCBA. Uh, yes. That's where we saw it. I was going to say, you looked familiar. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so you've seen this. It's CC changed slightly. CCBA is the Clackamas Clack County Business Alliance, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so we've done this a lot. But um, anyway, I'll go through it, and you can see where we're coming from. Um, basically, it's an education campaign, and you'll see at the end here we did some polling and with some interesting results. So, um, you know, our biggest message is we all live in Clackamas County, and we all own the roads in Clackamas County. And it gets confusing for people very quickly because of that. There's 806 miles of city-owned roads, which includes Oregon City, West <coughs> Lynn, Lake Oswego. Uh, I don't think River Grove or Barlow have roads. Johnson City has roads. Um, 1,400 miles of county-owned roads and 222 miles of state-owned roads. Um, and that's a lot. You know, the 1,400 for the county, Clackamas County is the most paved miles of any county in Oregon uh, that are county-owned roads. Um, we also, by the way, have the largest rural population of any county in Oregon. So we're, yeah. Just for point of reference, I think San Francisco is, from here to San Francisco is 800 miles? Oh yeah, I think that gets us to Mexico. So 1,400 is a long... It's a lot of miles. It's a lot of miles. Yeah, and, and other counties have more mileage by a little, but it's mostly gravel. And that's a lot of the eastern Oregon counties where they have tons of roads, but not very many of them are paved. Um, and so everyone in the county, we all own it even if you live in a city. Just in a city, you have the joy of also owning your city streets. Um, and so our problem, and the problem is not unique to us. It's not, you know, the cities, a lot of them are having the same problem, but it's certainly not unique to Clackamas County when it comes to counties, is our costs keep going up and our revenue is flat. Um, you know, this is a pretty, this group I, I assume knows much of what I'm going to say, but you know, our revenue is gas tax and vehicle registration fees and weight mile taxes. The gas tax went up for the first time three, four years ago, I think it was, that first time since the early 90s. And it's not a percentage, it's a set number of cents. Your gas tax is 30 cents that goes to the state of Oregon. And of that, 50-something percent goes to the state, about 25 percent goes to the counties to split, and probably a little under 20% goes to all the cities to split. And frankly, I don't know how the cities split the money because I've never had to care. Um, but the counties split it by vehicle registration. So Clackamas County gets 10% roughly of that almost 30% of the total. But we also used to get timber money, the secure rural schools money, uh, which is now gone, eliminated. We used to get four to five million a year. The gas tax increase was a little less than that. So we're really losers in the whole exchange. Um, but costs go up. People co cost more money every year, and um, the price of oil has not helped our endeavor to pave roads. Does so. the cost go up because you're building more roads? No. Well, the cost of people goes up. Our personnel costs go up every year. Cost of living increases, stuff like that. Um, and we're building some new roads, but also the price of oil. When I first um, came to the county, we're probably paying $35 a ton for asphalt, and now it's probably 70 to 80, mm -hmm. 65 if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're seeing something similar. And so it's skyrocketed. Right. And, and the amount of money, our buying power has gone down due to inflation. Um, it's just nice to know why those costs went up. Yeah, well, again, they, they, they Material go Material and labor. Yeah, yeah. Market economics. Um, and we've and we've reduced staff quite a bit in the last few years, but it's hard to catch up. Um, so you, you know, again, we use it to maintain and repair what we have. Responding to emergencies, which um, you know, I don't know, the city, Oregon City, probably does quite a bit of that. Some of our cities probably don't have much much of it to do, but you guys have very hilly terrain. Um, but we do a lot of it at the county. 
and it says constructing new roads. Frankly, we don't use our gas tax or road fund for new roads, really. It's mostly federal state grants. It's usually system development charges, urban renewal. Um, the road fund is match money sometimes, but we don't use much of it for new roads. Kiss that urban renewal goodbye. Uh, yeah, well, we still have urban renewal money. We're not, we will not be doing anything new, though. Chances yes. are slim, yeah. Without a vote. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, you um, you know, cities, you know, you guys, Oregon City has a, a, a fee. You guys have a utility fee. And a lot of, six of the 16 cities in Clackamas County do. And so they have an additional funding source. We get from citizens, if you consider it an average driver, um, who an average driver uses a little over 500 gallons of gas a year, got that off an EPA website. Um, you're paying about $4.25 a month for your county roads. That's it, total. You guys are collecting how much a month from your citizens right now? 11, yeah. 11 22. So we get 425 and that's it. So uh, it, it's not. Oh, well, that's what we're collecting with our. No, that, and that, you get more that's what, with your road funding, your gas tax. Yeah, uh, gas taxes, I'm not sure yeah. what it is, but. A per, lot less. Per, yeah. Yeah. But that's all we have. We in Clackamas County, yeah. Quick question on road maintenance. And I think you'll mention a, a divide between urban and rural yeah. or something like that later on but looking at the pictures the top and the bottom one there yeah. and having just driven on one that's even worse than that top but not yeah. that at the bottom a lot of rural roads are constructed before you had the current standards therefore the road base is inadequate so when you go in and maintain these do you differentiate if the road was never built to standard do you expect the county as a whole to pay for that or do the pro property owners that are but because their lot costs were less because they didn't have that quality road so they pay for part of that to bring it up to standard or not the answer is it depends um, so <laughs> I don't I don't know those two roads off offhand the bottom road is likely not a county road right that does not look like a county road it looks like what we call a local access road which means we don't maintain it we wouldn't maintain it unless it was built to standard the top road could actually be a county road, and if it is a county road, we are obliged to maintain it. Um, and so, now having said that, we have not been doing anything on local roads for quite some time. And, you know, um, it'll look like that, frankly, for many years before it gets worse because the traffic is just so light. But if, if it was accepted into the county system at some point in time, um, for whatever reason, then we are obliged to maintain it at some level. But if you had to do some major work on it to re right. rejig the base or something like that, would you it would be very low on the priority list. district with it having the budding property? Possibly. Like we've had we've had those before, but it would be very low on the priority list. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. That's our county. Um, a lot of people don't realize we go from the top of Mount Hood and this bottom point down here you, know, you can't see the point. Better use the mouse. You do use the mouse as a pointer. Can you see that? Ah, there you go. Top of Mount Hood. And then down here is, and for you in the sitting here, it's here, um, is actually further south than the northern point of, northernmost point of Salem. We are a pretty large county for such, for a county that has such a large urban area. Um, and you can also see, it with so it's a, an incredible variety of areas. You know, we have our huge urban unincorporated area in Oak Grove as well, which is a little unusual for a county. Um, you can see all the blue. That's all water. We don't like water. Um, water is a road's worst enemy, and we have tons of it. Um, makes our job a lot harder. I know we need water and all. Quick question. Yeah. I'm going back to the last screen. Um, I noticed that there are basically three sources for revenue, state, federal, and <coughs> local fees. And it's interesting to me that state revenue is mentioned under each on the bottom there, under cities, under county, and under state. Um, is that, does that mean that monies are coming from income tax and going no. into? It comes from the gas tax, and so, okay. and so um, that, that is state revenue. The state collects it and then they give it out to disperse local it to the cities and the cities give it for the roads. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's Perfect. what that means. You know what that distribution formula is about? I mean, what's it based on? Is it based on my, number of miles? Um, of population. That's for, a great question. For um, cities, it's population. It, it, it well, the fifty thirty. It's actually fifty thirty twenty, but yeah. but it's not fifty thirty twenty because ODOT takes money off the top, so they actually get more than the fifty percent. I don't know the exact percentage. 
That percentage came, I think, from, um, it's not new, it's in state law. And I think it was based on a perceived um, amount of need or some sort of share. It was analyzed and they came to that agreement. I don't know how old it is, Henry, I don't know if you remember, but it's probably at least 20 years old. I think it's probably older than that. It's yeah, I think it's based, older than that. probably based on the League of Oregon Cities and the League of Counties getting together yeah, if, the state. And, and it probably is, and I'm very active in the Association of Oregon Counties, and I know we're constantly looking at a lot of these, and we might go back to ODOT. You know, 50, 30, 20 isn't really that bad. Um, you know, a lot of other states, it's much, much worse, where the, where the, the state DOT keeps all the money. Mm -hmm. So 50 is state, 30 county, and 20 city? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then again, I don't... The city split is based on population. So the city's split it on population, so Portland gets all the money. <laughs> and and the count, counties are based on vehicle registration fees, or vehicle registrations. And so in Clackamas County, um, we actually you know, we have a lot. We're one of the larger counties. Multnomah County and Washington County have more. So we get the third most money of any county. Thank you. Okay, so... This is just our inventory of things, and again, I'm speaking to a group that knows this stuff, but the average citizen thinks pavement is a road. And <laughs> we say, well, actually, we have 150 traffic signals that we maintain. We also maintain signals, I think, for Oregon City and several, most of the cities, actually, in Clackamas County, we, we maintain for their signals. We, we, we pay, pay, reimburse you. Oh, we charge you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not doing that stuff for free. Yeah. Actually, we can't legally. You should, you should consider that, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, you get the, if you get the law changed. You would have to pay for the roads here. You just, yeah. left, you yeah. just left that out by accident. Right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> 150 of them are ours. Um, 180 bridges throughout the county. Um, one less because Henry agreed to take Anchor Way 15 years ago. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're six, welcome. Yeah. Seven, 700 miles of striping. Um, there's our road number. 1,900 manholes. Um, 2,400 miles of gravel shoulder, 8,000 culverts, 1,000 of those are fish passing, have to be meet fish passage criteria, 9,000 catch basins, 27,000 signs, and 111,000 feet of guardrail. That's what our maintenance folks take care of on a daily basis. Not all of it at once, but that's what we're responsible for. Um, and all that needs to be done before we even think about pavement. So I'll, br I'll move through this real quick. We do brushing, which here would be landscaping. Um, <laughs> you know, we, do, we, we, we do street sweeping. Um, you know, we, again, we do that sunny side road that you're looking at under the street sweeping, which is 40,000 vehicles a day, pretty highly traveled. Hey, Mike, I had a question about street sweeping when I saw this before. Yeah. You know, for Oregon City, we justify funding um, st our street sweeping program as part of our stormwater utility yeah. because there's probably just as much if not more justification for doing that to help improve stormwater quality than there is for clean streets. And I was curious if, you know, I know the county's got a couple different districts, you know, in that are more of the metro area properties. Do they pay into your street sweeping? Uh, um, generally, no. Um, they have. I know that Water Environment Services recently gave us extra money so we could do extra sweeping to help with the MS4 permit um, and the TMDLs. I think that got discontinued. So in general, I don't think they do. Um, they, they'll usually maintain to us that they're, the right-of-way is not TMDL. their responsibility. Hmm. You guys have to share a lot of love. Um, we, we do okay. <clears throat> <laughs> well, it seems like CCSD number one, which is those areas kind of outside the Tri-City areas uh, that are maintained by you guys, has a lot of justification for helping you out with that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they don't yeah. do it. But, um, you know, we, we're going to do it anyway. We have to. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, otherwise our inlets will plug. And uh, we're also required by DEQ because we're one of the permit holders on the MS4. Yeah. Seems to me like one of your big expenses would be gas and oil and move, uh, moving vehicles yourself. You know? Yeah, we have a fuel cost, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and how's your moving stock, your, your 
dump trucks and stuff like that, they've got to be replaced every once in a while, don't they? Yes, equipment costs a ton of money, a um, ton of money. Yeah, one piece of equipment could be half a million bucks, depending on what it is. Maybe more. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it, it, they age. Um, we, we hold on to them as long as possible because it's a huge expense. Um, we do a lot of shoulder repair. I don't know how much you have to do that in the cities, hmm. uh, but you know, when we leave the urban area, we don't, we don't have curbs, and so we have lots of gravel shoulders, and they're huge for safety, huge for safety, and they just take a beating. Um, and, and like talk talked about, most of our roads were built before there were standards, so they're not as wide as we like. We don't have a lot of shoulders out in the rural area. We make them when we can, um, but it's hard. We're usually right up against the ditch. Um, and ditching is another thing. Um, we are constantly maintaining our ditches. Um, they either erode or they fill up with sediment, one or the other. So we got to take care of them to keep that water out of the road base. We have a full crew full time working on bridge maintenance, working on those 180 bridges. Our bridges are actually in pretty good shape. Um, we did real well with the OTIA 3 program, which was the State or uh, Oregon Transportation Investment Act. We got to replace nine bridges as a county, and they were nine of our more difficult bridges. Carver's the last one we're finishing up now, um, but we did Stafford Road over the Tualatin, Ten Eyck over the Sandy, um, uh, all over the place. And there were some that we were really having problems with. Our bridges aren't perfect, far from it, but they're in pretty good shape. Of course, that won't last forever. And the programs that we've took, taken advantage of to replace them, that one doesn't exist anymore. And the federal one, like the one that helped replace Anchor Way, has almost no money. And feds, you know, every year they're holding everyone hostage by threatening not to approve money anyway. We'll see what happens this summer. Um, culverts, we're constantly doing that. Culverts are not as great. And, and they get damaged pretty pretty quickly in a storm. The one right here is actually um, Bernard's Road down west of Malala. Um, it was a corrugated metal pipe a couple years ago. just got absolutely folded up over itself in a big storm. So when that happens, we can't put the pipe back because it doesn't meet fish passage rules. So we end up putting a three-sided box culvert in, which costs a lot more money. But we don't have a choice. So once all that's done and all that's taken care of and all that money's spent to send crews out, then we can think about the surface treatment because if we don't do all that other stuff, we're throwing our money away. And we have not paved in about two years, not, not at all. We, we've been doing a lot of chip sealing. We did 63 miles of chip sealing last year. Um, you know, a chip seal, you throw down oil, you throw down rock, you throw down some more oil. And it's a seal, that's all it is. It doesn't add structure. You're simply preventing water from infiltrating into your pavement, that's it. And it doesn't last that long. Um, and at the same time, if the road's not in good shape, sealing it's kind of stupid. So you, we don't do it, and we just have to leave it alone. It's like if you had a deck that was rotten, you wouldn't bother waterproofing it. What's the point? Um, but we're chip sealing a lot of roads. We haven't paved anything. Next year, we're doing a paving package because we're using some of our federal, um, we get rural stip money that the cities generally don't get. Um, but it isn't a lot. We're going to do a little paving on Foster Road. That's next. What are stip monies? I'm sorry. What are stip monies? I apologize. A state Transportation Improvement Program, and so it's federal money that's allotted based on um, rural population and a couple other factors, and it adds up to like eight hundred thousand um, dollars. We also do a lot of emergency response on the upper left. That's Clackamas River Drive. Thank God we didn't have to do that this year, but just about every year we do something. That's a um, good spot. Yes. The, the bottom left is uh, Lusted Road, north of Sandy. That was caused mm -hmm. by one clogged catch basin. It was a huge slide. Um, the two middle pictures are, you know, one's Government Camp, one is Marmot Road, if you're familiar with that. Um, mm -hmm. Upper right is pretty close to here. That's actually Henrici at Beaver Lake. Um, a few years ago when the water overtopped the bridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom right there is Lolo Pass, and that's the Sandy River, and we yeah. moved the Sandy River a couple weeks later, back to where it was. And we still haven't gotten reimbursed from FEMA, still. What so, did, what did that cost? Uh, over two million, mm. and we're, we're floating it still. Um, and, and so just to put it in perspective, our, our 
ending fund balance is only about three and a half million dollars. We don't have 50 million stowed away in the bank. It's three and a half million dollars. And so we need to get paid. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a big problem. And, you know, we're lucky most of the, well, not Clackamas River Drive, but these other events were so bad in so many places that a federal declaration was made or state, but it has to be more than Clackamas County or it isn't eligible. And if it's not eligible, no one's bailing us out. It's all on us. Um, it's, and we never know when it's going to happen, so you don't budget for it. Which senator or Congress, U.S. Congress person would be the one That's to talk exactly about? exactly where I was going to go. To get our money? Yeah. It, it wouldn't help. But I appreciate that. We're eligible, and they have the paperwork. Mm -hmm. We're waiting to get through them, and then to get through Oregon Emergency Management. and then to, They have everything they need, and I'm expecting to get paid really, really soon. It's if not, I'm coming back here, and I'll let you know. <laughs> it's just like the checks in the mail. <clears throat> just to give you guys some insight on that, when I left Florida, I was still processing hurricane reimbursements from the 04 hurricanes from FEMA. Mm. They're, so, not, they're not fast. No. We pray that it's on a collector or arterial because then it's FHWA. FEMA only will pay you for local roads. And so and FHWA is so much better. It doesn't work the other way around if we're late on our tax bill. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> okay, right. No. Yeah, FEMA is very difficult. Yeah. I appreciate that. If, if it does come to that, I will let you know. Um, so how are roads doing? Um, you know, depends on who you ask. I'll show you that in a minute. But our local roads are, in, are not in very good shape. Three quarters of them are fair or poor. And it's because we haven't done anything. We've just let them go. We, you know, can't put our resources on our local roads. Um, we're at that tipping point now where if we don't start doing what we should do, our roads are going to become a lot more expensive to fix. Um, you know, the cost of paving as opposed to a chip seal you know, a reconstruction as opposed to a chip seal, it's probably a five to ten times increase. <coughs> um, it's huge. And then God knows what we'll find when we dig everything up and probably find a gas station or something like that. <laughs> happens every time. Um, so ways to raise money for a county, which would be different than a city. Some of them are going to be the same, but, you know, we have a different statute that governs what we can and cannot do. So, um, and this is just illustrative purposes. These numbers are have no significance and they're not suggestions or anything. It's just to give people an idea of what could be raised. So a vehicle registration fee is the only one on here that would have to be cover the entire county, I believe, um, and has to be split with the county and cities. And it would be a 60% county, 40% cities, unless negotiated otherwise. And that's in the law. Um, if it were to be $5 a vehicle per year, it would raise a million dollars for the county. Some money would go, but that's just the county portion. A year. A year, yeah. Um, by law, the county commissioners can make it $43 a year max. That's what you're paying to the state right now. Can't go above that. Uh, they can do it without a vote. They won't, but they could. Um, the road district, um, oh, and by the way, I should add, it is illegal to use property taxes on county roads. That is in ORS 368. I actually asked about that because all we got to do is strike out this sentence. I was told the League of Oregon Cities want to keep it, so mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm going to lose. But we cannot use property taxes on roads. It is not legal. And so a road district's a little different. It, it is assessed on property, but it's not a property tax. It's a district. If it was five cents a thousand, and I guess this is countywide, it would raise 900,000 a year um, for the county. That's um, something else that would have to be passed by the voters to create that district. Yeah, you can't do that without a, a vote, I believe. Yeah. Isn't that what Washington County has, though, that everybody's kind of desiring? Is there, don't they have a road district? Washington County, I believe, does have a, an urban road district. where Because the, and what they did is they put it up to a vote for <laughs> urban and rural, and the rural said no, and urban <laughs> said yes, so it's only urban. I think. I, I'm pretty sure it's a district. It's Washington, the, what's yeah, that? It's the whatever they call it. Yeah, M -stip. M -stip, they, but yeah. they have another one too. They, they also Washington County is an unfair advantage over every other county in Oregon because they are the only county in Oregon that is allowed to use property taxes on roads because they got grandfathered in when the law changed. 
because they already had a tax and it became part of their permanent tax base. If, just if, like the throw if they did there. a straight bond issue, voted on a bond issue, and you paid for the bond issue with property taxes, you can use that for county roads. I don't think so. Not if, it, not if the purpose of the bond is for roads. Well, we did that twice in Polk County. Twice. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Unless, and I don't know, you know, that's within the last 20 years. So you're years. saying put a ballot initiative on the t that would be um, collected via property taxes or exactly. property assessed value, but it would be for a specific reason. Exactly. Uh, of road maintenance. Right. No. It, it, maybe they formed a district at the same time. No, no, no. I was there. Yeah, I believe you. So, I mean, I'm just was, trying to figure no, out how that's no legal. district. It was just countywide vote yeah. on it, okay. a bond yeah. issue yeah. for six million to, you know, yeah. for that situation. They promised to pave 100 miles of road and they paved about 110. And then. I don't know how they did it because the way you're describing it, it doesn't sound legal. But I'm glad they got away with it. <laughs> well, I, I would say. Uh, it'd be interesting to see the statute that prohibits it, and I've heard yeah. that in the other presentation. What? Unless it's something new. Uh, no, it's not John, new. One thing to keep in mind is a bond is not a tax. Well, that's for him to keep in mind. Yeah. That's, point, that's my point. Yeah. So, so it sounds like it is similar to a road district where you vote, you pick an area that's going to bond the money. I mean, it might have might have been just done under a different segment of, of the law. I, I guess what I'm getting at is existing property taxes that you get assessed right. can't be. <laughs> no, I understand yeah. that. I understand it has to come you, from an addi additional revenue. Right. He's yes, suggesting exactly. that you consider what he's yeah. talking no, about. No, anything we did, we would likely consider bonding anyway, under any circumstances. Right. You know, because you get the money up front. Question, the, the 5 percent, or 5 cent uh, per gallon gas tax, that would be in addition to what was changed in yes. 2011? Yes. Okay. If I can just loop back, yeah. I think the Sunday paper had an article about Lane County or the city of Eugene, one of the, I'm pretty sure it was Lane County, solving some of its road pavement problems with a bond issue. So take a look at that, please. Yeah, yeah no, I, now, I, I, so you're talking about the additional funding. And so yeah, that's, yeah, so that's I'm not different. taking it out of the current yeah. property tax. Yeah. It's a separate vote for add on. Yes. Thank you. Also, can I get you to comment on their uh, their efforts or discussion? I know it's been ongoing for years, but having uh, bicycle uh, registration fees yeah. or something to that. So no, you can't get me to do that. <laughs> um, but I'm I'll sorry. say this because um, I'm not going to wade into a political arena because I am not a pol politician. Um, but I'll tell you what I what I hear, and no, they don't pay. I've heard at least one county commissioner say they think they should, and it wasn't a county commissioner you would think. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, the bikers will say, we own cars. We're already paying. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I hear. Okay. The, my opinion. Adam. I have a question here. The annual revenue estimate, that's for the Clackamas County. We're talking here Clackamas. Yes. These are be Clackamas County specific Correct. Uh, ways of raising additional funds. Correct. The road district would that be county wide or ex just the rural non city areas? Um, that's a great question that I should have come prepared with because this is the first city I'm actually talking to. Yeah, with this so that personally. would be so. Um, well, it says no, it says it's based on unincorporated Clackamas County, so at the bottom. So I'm going to say that's unincorporated Clackamas County. Small I'm sorry, right at the bottom of the screen. Small but that's for the vehicle registration. O only the vehicle registration fee is counted countywide. Right, by but the next number two, the road district. No, but it, after that it says all other estimates are based on unincorporated Clackamas. Ah, County. okay, I, I see it. Thank you. Yeah. So gas tax of five cents a gallon would generate $8.8 .8 million worth of revenue for areas that were unincorporated. unincorporated. That's County. what it says. Frankly, I'm a little skeptical. I have to, I have to ask. But that's what it says. And with fuel efficiencies going up so high in these cars, it seemed like that would be appropriate. Yeah, get, get, gas tax is not a very good, uh, it's flawed because, you know, we're all told help help out, save gas, and and then my first thought is great. great. And my second thought is now we won't have as much money. Electric cars are getting all free. Um, yeah, I think they pay, but they're not, you know, they're paying they a pay nominal fee. fee. Yeah. But well, they should pay for... They're wearing the road just as much as. Um, yeah, although although most yeah, I mean as much as as much as any other car. Yeah. The one thing that, um, you know, I was thinking of, I I had this similar presentation done at Clackamas County Business Alliance, yeah. and, you know, you look at Washington County and their, 
uh, program, and it has been success, and it it every so many years get renewed, and people are paying, and the county delivers. You know, they build roads, they build bridges, and it's funded, and everybody, you know, they, they said, this is what we want to accomplish. This is what we need. And people support that because they're delivering constantly. I think that's looking at that uh, there would be a good starting point because they have something really that works. They do, um, but their citizens voted for it to begin with. And well, but, we, uh, but... Well... I'm sorry, go ahead. But I think people would, you know, if you told me that you're going to go fix, you know, like a, a 212 or 205 or whatever, yeah. and it's going to cost a billion dollars to do that work, and, it, and it's going to cost this much dollar per person to fund that, then I can make that decision. Do, do I, as a citizen, support this? And do I, I mean, most people would support for something if you're going to go build it. Just paying into something that doesn't know what I'm getting out of I, it, I it's, 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 it's really yeah. difficult for people to, to yeah. pay additional money for so it. So if we actually were moving forward with something defined, it would be tied to, this is our plan. Exactly. Yes. And that, yes absolutely. And that, and that really gets you going. Once you do the one set of projects, yeah. people like it, they'll, they'll fund. That worked in Canby also. They did that same thing and they were able to deliver and then people were really happy and so they can Maybe Mike would like to finish this slide anyway. What's that? You haven't. You, oh, oh yeah. Well, we talked about the gas tax real quick, and then the utility fee, which is what what Oregon City and a lot of the the um, cities have. We'd have to figure out how to collect it because we don't own a water utility. Uh, but um, if it was five dollars a household yep. a month, it would at raise eight million. And I, uh, I had spoken with uh, with Chair Ludlow about the uh, about what we what we call the uh, the PMUF in Oregon City, the pavement maintenance utility yeah. fee, and uh, how. It's probably the, one of the most successful and well-received uh, fees that have ever been assessed in Oregon City because people can see what it does. They, they can see that. And as part of that, and as, there were two other aspects of that. One was there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of citizen input to create that, uh, uh, to determine how that matrix is going to be created and the fact that it was, it was ramped up over a period of years to where it is now. The second thing is that uh, each year, uh, Public Utilities provides an annual report to the City Commission saying exactly where that money is going and, I mean, the accountability and the transparency of that whole program is really remarkable and I was trying to convince the Chair Ludlow of all of this and he said, yeah, he says, but did the citizens vote on it? I said, no, they didn't, but there, there's really not any complaints about it Yeah. and he won't go there. No, he won't. They won't. It's not just him. Um, yeah, they won't do anything without a vote. But uh, that's that's. I mean, that's that's great. And uh, I look forward to hopefully one day getting the chance to be able to prove to everybody that we can spend their money wisely. You know, we would also set it up in its own fund, yeah. so that it's kept separate from all the other. It's money. it's very specific in Oregon City, and the fact that we I don't I think it's just curb to curb. We can't we can't use it for sidewalks yet. No. Well, um, the. The resolution and ordinance don't uh, go that far as to prohibit that, but our commitment to the committee and the commission was to, to include curb to curb. Um, because of the ADA requirements, we have been um, using it to pay for uh, improvements to intersection ADA ramps. The minute we pave a project, the, uh, the Americans with Disability Act rules require us to take care of those problems, so we have been using PMUF dollars to do that, which basically means we've got less PMUF dollars for curb to curb. So, I'm just saying that the transparency and the accountability and everything have been yeah. so phenomenal. I think it's a very well received, you know, that when I talk to citizens they say, yeah, I'm not keen on ever having to pay more fees, but that one I can see the results and, you know. And that's great. It's worth uh, you know, one thing that's a challenge for us um, is we're very large <laughs> yeah and it's people don't want to pay for projects that are 50 miles away but they want to vote on them well and they want to vote on them and so it's a bit more it's, it, it is a bit more of a uh, it's a yeah, they do and and, and 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 it's a bit more of a challenge in a lot of ways um, mm -hmm. so it, whatever strategy we would have we would have to get it geographically distributed over a quite a large area 
But that's fine. I mean, you pick a project in 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 in, in Happy Valley, and you pick one in Malala, and you pick out one at government camp, and yeah. and everybody's happy. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, I would I would support even more than what you're putting here on the numbers, yeah. but I just well, and like I say, these numbers are illustrative. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, we so we we believe that we need. 15 million a year to have a sustainable program where we can catch up over 20 years. And, um, you know, that's what we think we need. Do you have a similar scale that the city had when they were doing their analysis? There was the pavement, pavement index, what was it called? The uh, PCI. PCI. Yeah, the, PCI. Count, the county has that as well. Yeah, and that's, like that's where um, this came from. Okay. Uh, that fair, good, poor, excellent is mm -hmm. based on that. You don't have a 1 to 100 rating like that. We do. I don't offhand know it. Okay. Um, the methodology is developed by the Army Corps of Engineers. Mostly the um, municipalities and road maintenance organizations throughout the country use the same system. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not in the seventies. I'm pretty sure. And the point mm -hmm. is, the point is very clear that the the more current you can keep your maintenance, the less expensive it is. The longer they last, and the less expensive. Sure. It is. Yep. Exactly. Mm. And it's time for us. Or it's we're at that past curve. time, little past time. Well, it is, but it's but but our guys have done a great job with what they've had, um, and and so but it's time where it can't continue. No. So this is our problem, and I'm just about there. Um, we did a phone poll. Now this included the cities, so which, which <coughs> skews it because again a lot of the cities have money to do some paving. 76% uh, said, hey, our roads are great. Why did you include the city? Well, it wasn't my choice. Oh, okay. It's, well, it's likely voters, and so we had a polling company. I don't know. This is what, what happened. 55% <laughs> said, hey, you guys have more than enough money or the right amount of money. And oh, by the way, over half of them either didn't know how we paid for roads or thought we used property tax. I was surprised. <laughs> so, um, you know, that last one is very telling. And so, you know, it's, I, I believe the numbers are skewed too high, um, and, uh, but, you know, it's still, but, but the bottom one there is not skewed at all. It's probably similar in a city as well. Maybe a little different if you have your own utility um, fee, but. Uh, yeah, that they see every month. That they see every month, yeah, but um, everything else is pretty transparent because you don't see it. You pay at the gas pump and it's not broken out on your bill. So. Um, Anyway, that's, that's where we're at. We're going to keep doing the public outreach for another, I believe, six months. Yep, there it is, six months. Um, the board decided not to put anything on the ballot this year, and uh, partly as a result of our, our polling. And uh, we're going to revisit it again in about six months and look to see if 2015 will, will be the right time. So are you, besides coming here and talking to us, are you getting in front of somehow or reaching out the the ordinary citizens? I mean, how are you outreaching to them? We, well, um, I mean, there's a lot of ways. Apparently 28% don't know that yeah. what you even do. So, so we're, doing, we're doing a lot of things. So we've been doing a lot of presentations to uh, community planning organizations, Kiwanis Clubs, Chambers of Commerce, Clackamas County Business Alliance. I've been up in the mountain. I've been in Malala. I've been in Estacada. Um, so we've been going all over the place doing about two or three a week. Um, we also put it in Citizen News, which is the newspaper that does go to everyone in Clackamas County, and there was a whole big article about it. Some of these pie charts were yeah. all in it. And not everyone reads it, but it was there. And so we're using all the tools that are just, we have a website, um, so you know we're, we're doing what we can, and we're gonna keep spreading the word. And every time I do this presentation, again, it's usually to a group that's not knowledgeable about transportation. They come away actually kind of um, they learn something, and they're actually kind of excited about roads, which is great. Um, you know, but it's also usually people who are interested in things to begin with, and that's why they're members of the organizations they're members of. So. How many uh, employers are we losing due to our poor road conditions? Um, I, I don't have the answer to that, and likely not many right now, because I don't think we've gotten to that point, but at some point it'll happen. You know, um, one of the roads there that was all broken up was Jennifer Street, which is, you know, one of the hearts of our industrial area. We did pave that a few years ago, but um, you know, it's a, uh, it'll it'll start happening at some point. I mean, you got to get freight moving, or businesses will leave. 
Is that intersection out there, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, with Fred Meyer Warehouse. And the, <coughs> that's a pretty bad intersection. It's one of the worst in the state, isn't it? Yeah, 212, 212 and, and 82nd, but the sunrise is being built right now, and that's all the construction going on there, and that's going to help. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, ODOT already added an extra on-ramp lane um, going northbound 205, and that actually helped a lot. Didn't solve the problem, but it helped a lot. And now the Sunrise is a new highway from, um, God, what is it, 122nd. It'll go around Camp Withicum, and it'll connect right into 224 as a bypass to that intersection. That That's projected to take about 18,000 vehicles a day, so that'll help a lot, too. Boy, that's a, that's a choke point. Man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not good. I take Jennifer a lot. Yeah, I, I did today, too. I was out that way, and I go through Gladstone instead. <laughs> What could we do to help? Um, well, I would say um, spread the word. Um, you guys have heard this twice now, at least. Um, you know, my hope is when we do these is people are learning things, and then they're talking to their neighbors. Um, you know, we're going to keep doing the presentations. At some point, you know, again, this is all kind of nebulous. We don't have a specific plan yet. We don't even know if we're going to ask for anything yet because the board has to vote to do it. Um, but they're serious about it. I mean, all five of them take this seriously. And so, didn't, when, you know. Didn't C4 pretty much come up with a recommendation for the licensing phase? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so there's the whole C4 process, which is Clackamas County Coordinating Committee, which is the cities and the county and a few other organizations. Um, they're looking at other things, and it's a little independent of what we're doing here. And that's a, that was under direction of our Board of Commissioners. Commissioner Savis is very active in C4, and he brings that all back to the board. And, and so it's not being ignored. But um, our board has definitely given us the charge that these are county roads. We need to figure <coughs> out how to take care of them. It's a cute logo you got there. I can't figure what those people are doing, but it's cute. Nice colors. Um, you know, it's the first time I've really noticed what the helmet is on that person. What the helmet is. I think they're some kind of World War II army. Helmet. I think they're eating. Those are those are plates. No, it's on his head. It's on his head. Oh, it's a civil defense drill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a civil defense all, drill. They've all got the hats. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just want to let you know we're paying attention. Right right it's a cross section of light rail. Let, let, let's change the slide. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one other question yeah. on that. Uh, Vehicle registration fee, is that in addition to what we pay uh, through a DMV? It would be, yeah. So you'd pay, be, be paying two? Um, well, you, you would one pay one life. once. So you right now you pay every other year, and you pay $86. Um, it would be, so instead, when you went, if we did a $5, for example, mm -hmm. you would pay $96 every two years. Then the state would then disperse to uh, the county? Yeah, after, after they keep a little for their trouble. That's an interesting concept. It's kind of like the Selwood Bridge concept. Uh, it's exactly the Fast same, map. except it would pay for infrastructure within Clackamas County. Yeah. When I was a kid growing up in the they 60s, my folks County. lived on a gravel road yeah, yeah. Right. county. It was a public road. It was. Yeah. And about a month before any election, they ran the grader down the road. <laughs> <laughs> an old trick. Yeah, we don't really do that now. And I saw one time a dump truck dumping gravel. He lifted it and he went about a mile as fast as he could go and how much gravel to walk the back. We definitely don't do that. <laughs> um, we only have like, we have less than 10 miles of gravel roads that are county roads. We, we've really? really gotten rid of them. Well, this was an old logging road. Soon you will have more. That In the end, that's the idea. If you can't pave it, eventually it's gravel again. Yeah. Mike, I think that um, the county should look at starting, I, I know sometimes these things take time, but starting with a, a manageable group that you can not only get convinced, but you can deliver with and build that. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to being, uh, to what Washington County has. They've got so much maturity on their commission level that they've, you know, they've had the same elected you know, moving forward, these same initiatives for 15, 20 years. I don't know how long Roy Rogers has been running Washington County's program, but that means a lot. And so I just, I, I guess the other thing I'll put a stab in for is the, the problem with the road user fee and getting it mixed with cities is 
you know, basically duplication, you know, if, if it were to apply to citizens in the city, that would, I know that would be problematic because they're already feeling hit hard enough on that. So those are a couple thoughts that I have. And Nothing I haven't heard. But uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And you're right, you know, Washington County's had the same commissioners for a very long time. Yeah. One thing I didn't see on, on is like uh, essentially charging people based on their usage. Um, so you mean like uh, well, like ODOT, state driven? Yeah. So you know, so ODOT's been doing pilot projects. So it's not legal to do that right now. Well, so, I know it's not legal. Yeah, but, yet. but ODOT's been doing the pilot projects on that, and it's been pretty successful so far. You know, what, whether that'll ever actually happen. <clears throat> I don't know because a lot of people don't want the government to know where they're going because you need to do it via GPS. Even though they already know. Even though your phone's on and they already know. Yeah. So, but um, but that's you know. But it, but ODOT's been doing the pilot and the pilot is continuing and so a few thousand people volunteer and they actually put those devices in their car and I think you plug it into the uh, diagnostic port and uh, and it tracks where you've been and you get a bill at the end of the month. The uh, the other thing regarding to that re relating to that is the way that the uh, that Oregon City did its PMUF is that it's it's got a matrix depending on the type of residence, so uh, stores, uh, shopping malls, uh, fast food stores have a different rate, but everybody pays, even churches, right? I mean, uh, everybody yeah. school and district that, and yeah. that's government. Th that's pays, the key yeah. and why it's it's a utility right. fee. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, that, I mean, I think you have to. It has to be based on usage or anticipated usage in that case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know a lot of cities have capped it. Um, again, I'm not familiar with Oregon cities, but some cities have capped it so that the business doesn't pay over a certain dollar amount because otherwise it would be rather large. Onerous. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're uh, slowly but surely just pricing ourselves right out of business. Now I'm talking about everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's getting, you know, like you used the phrase tipping point. We're getting to the point where we, you know, we just can't afford it. John said one time that we can't, we just can't engineer ourselves out of this situation. There's just no solution in that regard. Yeah. And we might be able to throw so much money at this thing that it still doesn't work. The more money you throw at it, the more waste there's involved. It's just, it's just a conundrum. You know, it's it gets so big it's not manageable. And you get to a point where uh, there's a point of uh, you just don't get any benefit out of the the effort that you put into it. Well, we would get a lot of benefit out of this, and and you know it would result in roads being brought up to where they should be. Well, that I'm sure we can bring them up eventually, <laughs> but then you, you're still confronted with the problem that you're confronted with now that you've just given us maintaining it. Yeah. And we keep falling farther and farther behind. All Ma the time. Maintenance isn't very sexy, and so when they come up with tiger grants and stimulus projects and all that stuff, they want new roads and new stuff, and they don't pay for maintenance. It's always amazed me that this greatest country in the world has got more money than they can spend, and they don't know how to manage it. We're, there's something wrong with this picture. We should not be in this situation. We shouldn't. It's an economy of scale. It's a management problem. It's politics. I mean, a guy like you knows the technicalities of where we should be and how we should attack it. <clears throat> you go to the next level and try to fund it, and you run into problems. And it shouldn't be that way. <coughs> Fix, that <for> you. <coughs> Fix that for us. Yeah. So, Steve, we got a, no, okay. we got another yeah. group here. Sure. Who knows? Yeah. We could Thanks. probably talk all night Thank to Mike. I hope you yeah. enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, bringing it forward. You bet. Anytime. You'll stick around for theirs, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> okay. I, I wish them well. Appreciate you. Thank you for me. allowing me to sure. present. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. thank you. And the next on the item is Milwaukee Port Portland Milwaukee Light Rail Transit Project. And uh, we've got two people here. I think they've been here before. So yes, you you've uh, heard from Kerry Ayers, uh, Palinek, and Cora. Um, or I've forgotten your last name, but uh, Agnew. So um, they're going to present some some a little better news than we've heard from TriMet in the past. So uh, not to steal their thunder, but keep your ears peeled to this 
bit of a and you answered some of my questions before mm -hmm. and uh, so unhappy what I heard Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I'm so happy for you <laughs> I'm Carrie Ayers Pallet, I'm trying to, uh, service planning manager in Coral Agnew yeah. and community affairs for the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail Project. So um, we just got excited about roads so now hopefully we can get excited <laughs> about buses. Um, that'd be good. Um, when we were here about four months ago we were talking <coughs> about Portland Milwaukee um, Light Rail bus service and um, I just wanted to go over a few things that that we talked about just to kind of remind you we started with um, some assumptions on what would happen with the bus service once um, September of 15 start, comes. And that was that the 31, the 32, the 33, and the 99 buses that come mostly from this area uh, would go as far north as Milwaukee and then they would stop and turn around and come back. That was one assumption. The other assumption is that buses in southeast Portland, the 9, the 17, and the 19, would all go across the new Tillicum Crossing Bridge. And then there would be no other new service after that. And that was, those were the assumptions that we started with. And in the last four months, or five or six months, I guess, of this year, we've been listening to a lot of people who have a lot of comments on, on that, those assumptions that we had. And um, we have some major points that we heard from people. In southeast and southwest Portland, we heard a lot of, um, well, we're concerned about not having service in inner southwest if you put all those buses across the new bridge rather than on the Ross Island Bridge. Um, we'd like to see service continue on McLaughlin. We'd like to see service in Selwood. We'd like to see service on the Selwood Bridge. We didn't ask about that, but that was one of the things that we heard. In Milwaukee, we heard we'd like some more neighborhood service um, and uh, connections from the neighborhood to the light rail. That's what we heard in Milwaukee. In Oregon City, we heard loud and clearly from many riders of the 33 and the 99 that they don't want to transfer in Milwaukee. They'd like to be on the bus and stay on the bus until they get into um, downtown Portland or wherever they're going north of Milwaukee. We also heard you'd like more service. Um, Especially in the south end. South end, many places. Clackamas Heights, we also heard that um, you'd like more service there. So. Um, with those thoughts from everybody that we heard from, we put together a plan, and I'd like to just go over that briefly with you tonight. And I'd like to start in the north, and what we have done is, so like I mentioned earlier, the 9, the 17, and the 19 were, the assumption was originally to go across the new bridge. Well, we're gonna um, have the 9 and the 17 go ahead and cross that, but we're gonna keep the 19 on the Ross Island Bridge on its current routing. It goes through Selwood, comes up through the Brooklyn neighborhood and crosses the Ross Island Bridge and then would serve inner southwest Portland. So that's one of the changes. The next would be moving down toward Milwaukee. Currently there is some neighborhood service that goes between Clackamas Town Center and um, downtown Milwaukee via Harmony and Linwood, King, and through some uh, streets north of King, down 32nd, and into downtown Milwaukee. That's what it currently does. This proposal has the 3028 and the 34 going from Clackamas Town Center along Harmony, Linwood. It would continue then on Linwood up to Johnson Creek Boulevard, over to the Tacoma Park and Ride, serve the Tacoma Park and Ride, it would then travel south and serve the Milwaukee Park and Ride, used to be called Southgate, into downtown Milwaukee, where it would then continue on and provide other service on the River Road portion, the Line 34, and the 34 goes on River Road and it goes over to Gladstone and then into Oregon City and does some trips up to Clackamas Heights. So that's a change, putting the 28 and the 34 together. Currently, both of those lines run about every 70 minutes. 
and the proposal here is that they would run about every 35 minutes so we would double the frequency on those so more service coming into Oregon City and more service going up to Clackamas Heights I'm not positive that every trip would go up to Clackamas Heights just yet but more trips would than than what does currently the, the chart shows 34 going up to Clackamas Heights, but 28 only going to the transit center in Oregon City. Oh, that's a good point. So, <coughs> you know, this 2834 is just, it would still be the line 34 south of Milwaukee, and it would be the 28 um, through Milwaukee and over to Clackamas Town Center. So it, it would still function mostly like it does right now. However, if you wanted to ride from, say, Gladstone, Oregon City, Gladstone, and you wanted to go to the Tacoma Park and Ride, you could stay on that same bus, whereas right now you couldn't on the 34. So doubling the frequency for neighborhood service. Then the other um, change that we have proposed is for the Line 99, and that would be where it travels from either Clackamas Community College or Oregon City. It does both. North McLaughlin into Milwaukee. It would continue then north on Main Street. It would serve the Southgate Milwaukee Park and Ride. It would also serve the Tacoma Park and Ride. And then it would continue on Tacoma, across the Selwood Bridge, up McAdam, potentially over Nebraska and Corbett into downtown Portland. Now, so what this is doing is allowing people to have a choice. Yeah, you can stay on the bus if you want to have that single seat ride. It's probably going to take you a little longer, but you can have that single seat ride or you can transfer to rail at Park Avenue or in downtown Milwaukee or at Tacoma. It also provides service from the Selwood neighborhood, not only into downtown, but to the Tacoma Park and Ride. That's something I didn't mention, is that currently the 99 is a peak hour express bus that goes from Oregon City north into downtown in the morning, and in the afternoon it goes from downtown all the way south through Oregon City in the afternoon. This proposal has it going in both directions, so not just the peak direction. So in the morning peak it would go to and from Oregon City to downtown. So that allows people in the Selwood area to get to Tacoma, and it allows people to get from downtown to Oregon City if they wanted to take a 99. And it would still, just a still be an express bus? Well, it would be what I would probably consider a limited stop bus rather than express, because it would probably make a few stops after Tacoma, <coughs> maybe three on Tacoma Boulevard, um, maybe three to four between the west side of the Selwood Bridge and downtown. Uh, it would still be weekday peak hours only. The span of service would be about the same as it is currently. I mean, this, this seems like great if you're if you're going to go to a, you know like down to Selwood or or that area. But if you're going downtown, then you probably would want to jump off on the on the rail. So th I mean this. Looks it's good. Like a compromise, yeah. It's yeah. A compromise. We're trying to um, address as many of the issues as we could um, with with the changes that we could do. Well, I've been in touch with the Clackamas Heights oh. people, mm -hmm. and they're absolutely delighted with the possibility of increased service there. You would you'd be amazed at their glee. Oh, good, <laughs> good. Yes. Any other questions or comments about the proposal? This isn't in regard to that, but is there a route that goes from Oregon City to Clackamas Town Center? The Line 79 mm -hmm. goes, um, and I can yeah. kind of show you. Obviously, I'm not a bus rider, so. I from Oregon City to? Yes, yeah. Clackamas yeah. Town Center. Yeah, so the 79 goes through Gladstone, and, I can't yeah. and it goes yeah. right up here, North and then it kind of mm -hmm. goes oh, up okay. there, and it goes into Clackamas Town Center. Yeah. Isn't there also the, the route from the community people. college to the town center? Or is that... Uh, that is not run by TriMet. That is a uh, shuttle that the community college, I think, um, helps fund. But anybody can ride it? Yes. Maybe. And yeah. it's free. Yeah. Oh, it's free? As I haven't heard that. Is that between the Clackamas community, community and the Harmony Road? 
campus? Is that the they go to the Harmony Road campus, but they also stop at Clackamas Town Center. Yeah. Okay. And there's not to this isn't another TriMet service, but another opportunity to plug this one that the um, Mary Merrill Hurst Merrill Hurst uh, Mary's Woods Mary's Woods bus area. route between basically uh, Merrill Hurst University and um, I think they go up uh, to Oregon City Evangelical Church mm -hmm. and they run along Warner Parrot and South End and so it's a little different route it's another I think it has four trips a day it's not a, it's not a TriMet but it is a grant funded program that they were I thought that they were supposed to come to a meeting here in the too distant future to talk about that but <coughs> yeah um, the the map that you have there is is really nice and comprehensive can you scroll to the bottom please and um, see where we live here is Oregon City which is just if you could have just gone another couple of inches there <laughs> <laughs> it's a I also will we'll, um, you have a little blow up of of our internal city services I have one on another file here okay not sure just let me you try, I want you right click. Are you looking for a file manager? Right click on the start. Yeah, yeah that'll work. And then. Uh, this one? I think so. Yeah. I'll delete them all. Aha! You do exist. <laughs> you want to see further south? Okay. As far as it goes. Yeah, that, no, that's fine. That's fine. <coughs> and up a little bit, please. Maybe you could zoom that a little smaller. <laughs> so not too much has changed there, huh? They're not, the they're not changing anything there except from the city, from downtown the transit to, station up. to Portland. And through here and the 34 yeah. yeah but just improving the frequency of the service Good. Got it. thank you so we'll be um, taking this public uh, hopefully by the end of the month we'll have all this information online we're going to have people on board the 33 and the 99 and all these bus lines talking to um, customers we're going to be getting that input through the summer and once we get that data and kind of churn it around a little bit we'll see if there are revisions that need to be made and if there will be that'll be in the fall and uh, we'll let people see that revised proposal and then again at the end of the year we're hoping to have a final draft for um, bus service starting in September of 15. I was curious that this is not, nothing to do, but it's, they seem like moving pretty fast with the construction. It seems like they're ahead. We are right on track. Right we on don't. Track. We never want to yeah. say ahead. We are. We are right on track. Um, as you see with the bridge, we've completed our final deck pour um, in May, so the Tillicum Crossing is now completely joined together. And um, following all that construction, we'll be putting on systems, which is the wires and the overhead. And then there's training and testing. So we are very close to completion of construction, but we need to go through training and um, our safety certification before we open it up to public. But we are, we are right on track. Quick question: um, Would you open up the bridge for pedestrians and bicycles before the? lines all ready to go if the bridge is ready oh john you are one of many people that asked that lovely question um we we, the same question. <laughs> <laughs> we right now are not anticipating on opening up the pedestrian and bike portion of the bridge early um before revenue service because we will be doing all the bus operator training and the the rail training and we don't want to have people on the bridge while we're doing the training so, um, but lots See, of people have asked. Well, that, that kind of but I'm curious, you already, have, you're already operating the system. You already have the guys that 
run the trains and all stuff? Why do you need that it's, much? It's a new new route, and so any new route needs to be safety cert certified before operation. And so as we bring, we'll be bringing test trains across the bridge um, probably early 2015, and you'll be testing the wire heights and making sure all the system is operating properly beforehand. And each one of our operators need to be certified on each route and each leg of that. So every one of our operators has to go through this training before Okay. before it's opened up to public and the pedestrians and the bicycles interfere how uh, <laughs> well they'll be on the structure itself and so if we want to try to do any type of training and we want to have say our supervisors out there we want to be able to be in a right of way without impeding public traffic and so so and that's so why. instead instead of them being in out there in person they're going to be out there in the pickups no, they would probably be out there in masses. Like um, you'll have several people out there, and then you don't want to have to block the 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 way that we have it structured right now. As far as the um, striping goes for the pedestrian accesses, is pedestrians are on the kind of the river side of the um, of the walkway. So that's both sides on the north and the south side of the sidewalks, and the bikes are on the inner portion of it. And so they'll be. We don't want to be impeding bike traffic or forcing them to mix with the peds, and we want to make sure that we have everything, everything good before we open up to public. We really want to make sure we do that. But that is a conversation that people are talking about, and you know, TriMet, you know, if if everything goes well and and who knows what happens, potentially it could be thing, it could be a potential. But the way that we have our safety certification structure right now with training. It doesn't look very likely. But another you question. Get bonus points if you did. Oh, I know. Oh, trust me. Our, our general manager knows the bonus points mm -hmm. that we would get with this. But we want to make sure everything is is safe before we open everything up. Since there'll be several bus change route route changes and time changes, can you explain how you implement the transition so people get informed and stuff like that? I'm not familiar with that. Um, you can we we have um, we'll have people on board. We'll have probably media messages. We'll have um, our website. We'll tell people. We have um, email lists that we push out to people who signed up that said, "I want to know if there's any changes on my route." We'll do that. We'll email blasts. Um, there will be a lot of information that comes out to passengers and to people letting them know um, what the changes will be. And they generally go fairly smoothly then in the transition? Generally they go very smoothly, yes. Okay. Yeah. Our customers kind of know to look for that type of stuff and you know they'll be knowing about the, the train way in advance and um, <coughs> like I said we're going to get on board <coughs> real soon within the next few weeks telling people about the potential changes and then we'll we'll make a real concerted effort prior to the change probably in next summer um, to let people know on these bus routes affected that there'll be a change coming so we have a lot app, of positive response isn't there an app trying that app there's an app for that, yeah. Um, no, <laughs> just, no, we do. We do have a. We do have a TriMet mobile app um, for our pieces, but what the public it? comment piece of it is actually what, on what our website. Yeah, sure. For yeah. the public comment piece, <laughs> and so when you sign up for Rider Alerts, they get an automatic push to your email that goes into um, whatever line you ride. One of the biggest things that we did have a huge positive response back was from our onboard outreach. A lot of people that came to our open house, which the Oregon City open house is scheduled for July 22nd here at the uh, Pioneer Community Center. So um, we will be reaching out to local, you know, local writers as well as residents to get feedback about our service planning efforts and that we really want to have this. When is that open house? On July 22nd. That's a Tuesday. Just down the street. Question. The um, Milwaukee Light Rail. That will be the orange orange line, right? Correct. That'll be that we'll be using the Tillicum Crossing. Oh yes. Okay. And um, given that there's construction not only on the bridge but also all the way up, you know, to uh, in in Milwaukee, um, is all that to be coordinated so it all kind of completes at the same time? Yes. Um, on the west segment is basically from Portland State University down to the Willamette 
is um, in our what we call substantially completed. It already has the, if you drive down that way, you'll see the wires overhead leading up to the bridge abutment. And like I mentioned, the bridge is um, now connected. We do have our northbound track all in place with some concrete poured. But leading up to that, we still have some more work on the east segment. So the east segment going through the Brooklyn area, through um, 17th Avenue, you'll start to begin to see it take shape. There's lots of coordination that's going on with this. We have, um, we're, we're on track to do that, but like I said, the west segment is com substantially completed. The bridge is northbound track done, but we still have a lot more work to do um, on the east side, but we look to be substantially completed, turned over to systems which is for the overhead wires in uh, November. So we are, and we're still, we're still moving good with that schedule. So the grand opening, you said it before. And September, September 12th, 2015. Mark your calendars. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. I mean, it seems like the contractor has been moving, yeah. um, all, you know, pretty good pace. We, we just, um, we have three different contractors, three different, it's broken up into three different um, project pieces, segments. And we kind of looked at the overall piece of that. We have been building this project on time, on budget, as well as safely. So we are really excited that everything right now is falling into place for our opening. So we are we're very confident with our date. At what point do you <coughs> schedule the bridge going from the Tillican Bridge just to the plain old Tilly? Because <laughs> it will happen, young lady. It will happen, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> well, yeah, you start giving it its own little names. <laughs> Day two. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say, too, that, you know, a lot of people come into the bike store in, in Oregon City and make comments, and I've heard at least three, maybe four, over the last four or five months uh, say, and not, I didn't ask, but they uh, indicated that they're moving to Milwaukee. Why are you moving to Milwaukee? because I can be close to the light rail. So, you know, we heard all the negative news coming in, and I'm, I'm, oh boy, I haven't, so I'm encouraged. I think one of the greatest um, pieces of that and for our biking, and as you, we talk about the systems and the roads and the components and getting to it, so we have the connections with our buses to the rail, the connections with pedestrians as well as cyclists. But over at the park and ride station, there's a covered, secured bike area that um, is specifically geared for cyclists to access our light rail. You use the magic word, secure. Secured, yeah. oh yes. You service, 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 mm -hmm. but <coughs> included in that is security. Yes, it is. You've got to have passenger security, which generates confidence. Mm -hmm. And we are initiating um, our Harry Supporta, which is our safety and security director, he is working with the um, local police um, departments as far as coordinating a safety and security plan as well. So we are getting well ahead of that. It's a sad thing that it's necessary, but you know, we live in a real world. That's right. Anything else? Thanks. Thanks for <clears throat> keep us posted. Will do. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Okay. Public Works Report. Actually, you're up. <laughs> um, let's see. So, switching gears. Thank you, Carrie and Cora, for that. That those compromises. <laughs> um, so, let's see. We're going to start off with a couple topic. The topics that Martin's going to go ahead and go through, um, and then I'm going to talk about. Lynn Avenue, some roundabout discussions, and uh, a couple other things. So, Martin, you want to go go ahead? Um, so, we've got a few things you guys have some updates on. O, o dot accident data. Hold on. <coughs> I'm going to have a man come out and yell at me for a second. <laughs> um, you, you asked for some information on the O dot accident data. We hadn't received a reply yet on our request for further information on those. So, um, we'll table that until we have some information at the next meeting to provide for you guys. Um, Upcoming road closures, we've got several events that will be occurring within the Main Street corridor um, as well as other parts of the city within the next few months. 
Um, we wanted to kind of bring them to your attention as we may or may not have a subsequent meeting during those time periods. This weekend is the second annual Clackamas Cove Triathlon, which I know um, we uh, wanted to talk about a little bit further so we can kind of go into a little further discussion with that now, or do you? No. Okay. Go ahead. So um, we've been working with Patrick Bolin in terms of permitting a, a final race route. Um, we've been coordinating with himself, um, Clackamas County, o Oregon City Police Department. We had a tabletop meeting earlier this week and finalized all of the routes and um, closures that need to be required for the uh, event to occur. Last year they were able to um, run the running portion of the uh, event along the Main Street corridor, basically come up to 7th and then go through the elevator tunnel and use the staircase, taking the runners up the staircase and then down back into um, down Singer Hill into the Main Street corridor again. Uh, city was, you know, willing to permit this. We weren't changing or requiring anything additional to uh, the traffic control than what we'd required the previous year. But due to financial constraints from the applicant's insurer, um, he wasn't able to pencil everything out to make all of the dollars um, equate to make that run portion feasible. Um, so at uh, when he found that out, we worked with him to try and propose an alternative um, run route. He had a preferred alignment that he wanted to go um, with along Agnes Avenue, which is private right away. So we helped him in trying to facilitate getting um, all the uh, um, approvals. approvals from West to utilize that route. Go ahead, Just to clarify, now yeah. the, as I understand it, the first year there. Um, the runners were running in traffic or along mm -hmm. with traffic. There were there was no there were no street closures. There were closures. Oh, there were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, there were, it was almost the exact same traffic plan that they had submitted the previous year. Yeah, that's right. It's Is actually that's what he submitted um, for us to review. Okay, I misunderstood Patrick then because you know it's strange to me that the insurer would suddenly have a problem with that. Yeah, but you have to remember they weren't full closures. They were controlled intersections. So we had police um, deputies at, or police officers at several of the intersections, and then portions of it were run along with traffic. Okay, so, okay, so there was some, and that, that's what the insurer was concerned yeah. about, was the liability exactly. hazard. Um, yeah. Okay. And we'd met with Patrick, and you know, he'd floated the idea, could, could we do a complete road closure for Main Street? The difficulty is, and I explained this to him the other day, the perfect example is the Teddy Bear Parade. In order for us to facilitate that road closure for the teddy bear parade, it takes the full arsenal of all of the traffic control devices that Public Works has. And then I have to borrow some. Um, as well as significant number of man hours um, staging up the day before. We have almost the entire street division staff on site for the entire period. And then a significant amount of hours to stage down. Um, the cost, when I look through the, our work order management system, is um, over two thousand dollars for mm -hmm. the city. You know that we have to absorb for the teddy bear parade. That's not a cost that we would be able to absorb for a private function like the triathlon. So it, wa it wasn't something that was really on the table for him to, to implement. Yeah, you, you, the city would not have to, I mean, there's a, obviously the teddy bear parade is kind of grandfathered in, I guess, mm -hmm. and that's why you absorbed that. Um, Lions Club just took that over, um, so we're helping to coordinate that. But the triathlon, that would be a pay, they would pay for that, about four grand? It's a little over $2,000. Oh, okay. But that's not accounting for vehicle cost and um, materials. That's basically mm -hmm. staff and some of the few billable resources that we have. We, we don't bill out for every you know, type two barricade or type three barricade like but, you would with Northwest traffic control. But we shared with Patrick three to four thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Number, okay. So. It, and then the, my understanding is it's Sunday morning mm -hmm. from 9 a.m. to 12 would be the window. It's uh, permitted, the road closure is permitted to take effect uh, at 8 a.m. and okay. then cease at 11. The actual okay. road closures will start rolling out just prior to 8 a.m. Okay. Um, and the alignment, so everyone if you want to come out and watch, is actually a lot of fun. 
Um, the swimming will be going uh, going on within the Clackamas Cove. Um, the primary viewing area is Clackamas Park. Um, the swimmers will swim in the cove, come out into the river, um, come up the boat ramp into Clackamas Park into what's referred to as the transition area. Um, from there, they'll get on to um, the bike portion, and they'll. We have <coughs> permitted the closure of Clackamas Road, Main Street extension through 14th. Um, the cyclists will come up through that route, then go up um, 15th to Washington, take Washington into the nether regions of Clackamas County, make a U-turn, come back the route that they um, exited on, go back into the transition area, which is Clackamas Park again, switch into their run apparel, and then from there they run a 3K along the um, trail in the cove area will transition out onto washington street and go out across the um, head bridge circle back around and then utilize that private right of way that um, west has allowed them to use on what on what's referred to as agnes road um, my only comment that you know um is that you know given if you compare the teddy bear parade to the <laughs> cove triathlon and you know in terms of tourism um, last year they had 275 participants for the first time out out of the gates uh, this year I think they have in excess of 400 so some of these triathlons bring in one of them was referred to in the grant application that he sent me uh, had 11,000 people in it um, that's in a different state but my point is is that this the attention that this kind of event draws to the, the average income of a triathlete it's called the new golf mm -hmm. and the average income of triathletes is $161,000 so having them you know run down the center of Oregon City is in my opinion is a really really great it's really cool to be able to run up the the grand staircase that that's an attract that's attractive to these participants oh you get to do something different um, so I, I just the only comment I have is just to, that we not get so focused on the cost and in this case it doesn't seem to be a cost because they're willing to pay it um, but you know that we we embrace and support these kinds of uh, tourism draws uh, and you know my hope is that Clackamas County will become known in Metro uh, you know as the recreational the outdoor recreational Mecca uh, within within the uh, tri-county and I think this would be one that would just be great for our city. So just, you know, just thinking about that and that we really want to embrace uh, this and do everything we can to accommodate. Um, and it, I, I really like the idea of running up the staircase. I don't know, do they go across the bridge? No. Okay. Yeah. No, he, tried, up the he initially, on the first uh, like triathlon, it. tried to permit that. Yeah. And the complications associated with that are yeah. immense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and we never at any instance told him, you know, no, you can't run through Main Street. We simply outline what are the minimum safety requirements. Okay. Um, and what the and costs then, are. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, I believe that our cost, if we had done a full road closure, would have outweighed what the insurance was requesting um, for the coverages that he needed. Mm -hmm. um, from what the, the discussion I had with Patrick yesterday, um, he wasn't even able to get a, a rider for an open course foot race um, mm -hmm. going through Main Street. They just nobody would issue it. Right. So the only option was to go with a closed course. Well, in terms of our, you know ROI, you know for Oregon City, you know, and, and again I love the teddy bear parade, mm -hmm. and we're you know, but in terms of uh, if you're going to subsidize something, that, that I think would be a great well, great one to think about. But not that it's required. They just have to increase their fees or do something or get a grant. Yeah. To cover that but you know I, I think John will kind of test you when I arrived here um, I've got about two dozen of these races under my belt I used to do them a lot I used to have mm -hmm. a lot of fun until I blew my knee out and when <laughs> Patrick came last year and said we want to do this triathlon I really was like John I really want to make this happen and John said let's make this happen and we worked with them last year we worked with Patrick this year it's just financials have to pencil out for all parties okay so you got the triathlon this weekend. Uh, like I said, road closure begins at 8, so if you want to get into your viewing areas, 
Um, Clackamas Park's a really cool area to go check it out, and then they have the post-race party down there. Um, coming up July 26th, it's not on your agenda, is also the first city celebration with the Main Street organization. Um, we are finalizing the traffic control plans for that, um, coordinating with Jonathan Stone. And then finally, you have the Antique Fair Show, which is scheduled August 24th. And we've met with the Chamber of Commerce, who's the sponsor on that, and are also working with them to um, finalize the um, traffic control requirements for their event. So, Notice the car show is not down. Car show is not until September, and we think you guys will probably meet before then, so we didn't throw it on this agenda. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Signage on the Clackamas Trail. John and I went out and took a look at the area that the gentleman from Gladstone, I love getting requests from Gladstone residents. <laughs> um, uh, the gentleman from Gladstone had indicated there was a slight dip on the Clackamas Trail. Um, there is a slight dip there. Um, I don't know if we formulated a full decision as to whether we're going to implement it dip in the road sign or anything out there but in terms of the fencing and this tunneling effect that's not something that was apparent to, to any of us while there was while we went out there I welcome anyone to go out and take a look and if you have a different opinion let me know when I don't the dip in there it wasn't like that you're going along and there's like a dip I mean it's it's a major you know it's a drop in a bank yeah. right in a shadowed area right mm -hmm. you're not gonna I don't it. have an MUTC sign that I can mm -hmm. order that says you know, caution, right. drop with banking curve, shadowed area ahead. <laughs> so um, <coughs> dip in the road or, you know, grade change is about the most appropriate signs that we could put yeah, out there. Across. I'll tell you what is an issue there, though, mm -hmm. and if you've, any of you have ever ridden uh, the, the Clackamas Cove Trail there. Um, yeah, I'm riding along, and, and, you know, the wife has a, a front suspension, and I've got a drop handlebar, you know, carbon mm -hmm. fiber or whatever, but pretty stiff. and. And all of a sudden, there's roots that have raised that pavement, and, it, and I'm talking to her like, bam, bam, bam. Well, I tell you what, it'll wake you up. Yep. Um, I don't know if that's speedy. You should be sleeping in case you were asleep. Yeah. I'll tell you what. But you know, the thing is, I, she said, "Well, why don't we get this repair?" And I said, "Well, you know, the the code once that construction starts, that that's probably all going to be revamped anyway." So. I'm, I'm not sure on that. Um, that's a concern I can convey over to Parks and Recreation. Though. There's been a gas tax on that trail. Um, no. Next one is yours, John Lynn Leland Myers. All right, so we've been pretty active with the corridor study on along Lynn Avenue. If you remember, it starts at 5th at the bottom, kind of what we think of as kind of the bottom of that corridor, just, just as it enters the McLaughlin neighborhood. Starts there and goes all the way out to um, out on Myers Road, out to Moccasin. So it's a pretty, pretty long corridor. Um, we had an open house last week. Uh, I know Henry was there. Bob, were you there? William was there. I can't remember if Bob was there or not. I no. see you at too many meetings. About, but then mm -hmm. I did see William. I remember that because I hadn't seen William in a long time. And he showed me his busted up knee and told me about his accident there. So uh, welcome back, William, because we hadn't seen you at many meetings. But... Um, Anyway, so this Lynn Leland uh, Myers corridor study, if you remember, it's really looking at how, what that corridor could look like or should look like in the future. Some of it's built out and um, because of the topography and the existing neighborhoods, there might, there's sections of that that probably wouldn't change a lot, but um, still tr trying to look at uh, standard cross sections for that roadway, looking at connectivity. And uh, it was really a pretty good turnout. We had 60 people actually sign the list that said they were there. And I, we think we missed some because we found we were a little bit understaffed with uh, that open house, which doesn't always happen with our open houses. So I was really pretty pleased with that um, uh, because it was, I think, um, 5 to 7, so it was during the dinner hour. It was a nice evening. We had it at the... Um, at the annex building at, at um, the Mount Pleasant Elementary School site and um, anyway good turnout and um, lots of good comments we several people filled out comment cards I would say about half of those filled out comment cards and the uh, what I, I guess a couple things I wanted to say that the the we're kind of winding winding down our 
public um, kind of just open and informal public <laughs> in, uh, information gathering phase. We've we've had the online survey online for oh, I don't know six weeks or so. It seems like uh, we've got a fair amount of activity there. We had about 200 people fill out that online application, and we're seeing that drop off significantly from the first couple of weeks in which we had that on but uh, it's still up now we haven't decided to, to pull that down we're kind of ramping up for our first Planning Commission work session out of that uh, concept plan is a report and we're kind of reviewing that report there's actually two major sections that are have yet to be kind of inserted in that report but the reports online the draft reports online but um, what it really talks about is the existing conditions and kind of some of our programs doesn't talk too much about what the solutions are or what we've kind of narrowed our search to. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a fair amount of data there that we need to look at. Survey results <coughs> um, have a, you know, I don't, if, did you, I don't know if you all filled out the survey or not. But I if, if, if you remember the survey, it's, it, it's asked a fair amount of questions about you know, Lynn, between, we've, we've split this project or this concept plan into four segments. So the bottom segment is um, kind of the most treacherous segment out of the, out of the four. Uh, well, I guess that's debatable, but I, I think that's one of the areas where we were first kind of inspired to do a corridor study. And so we're seeing results on whether or not people like the 10-foot wide sidewalk and bike lane that could be a shared bike lane um, versus two five-foot uh, sidewalks and and uh, bike lane so that we're seeing more results that are favorable of the two five foot wide sidewalks and uh, an uphill bike lane and a shared use bike lane on the way or shared use lane on on the downhill side a lot of support of the idea of closing um, electric avenue or if you remember near Singer Park there there's kind of that triangular um, island there and we've uh, we asked the question about closure of that and people have been supportive of that idea and we like that because it might provide some opportunities for maybe some park parking for the park or some stormwater management there's you know definitely some of the safety issues associated with people trying to turn on Electric Avenue would be resolved so um, we definitely like that idea um, people were pretty um, their, their priority in terms of the connectivity was to try to get um, sidewalks between Gardner Middle School and Lynn Avenue. Currently there are none, so um, out of all the, the kind of the pathway connectivity options, that was what people were pretty excited about. Um, uh, the comments we heard a fair amount about at the open house were about Myers Road and uh, the desire by, um, there was a handful, I would say maybe three property owners who showed up that actually lived along that stretch of Myers Road, who seemed supportive to the idea of a wider boulevard with sidewalks and um, you know um, elimination of the roadside ditches so stormwater system along there so that was good to hear uh, the the big controversial issues around about and and really um, in your packet here we've got um, some uh, flyer that we handed out at that which were benefits to roundabouts seems like those people who understand roundabouts and have been exposed to a fair amount of roundabouts typically prefer them those that aren't have some real concerns about them. So I think um, kind of like Clackamas County needs to get the word out with regard to its road maintenance, we kind of need to get the word out with regard to roundabouts. And we need to also make sure, um, we talked a fair amount with Wallace, the consulting engineer. You know, we're not proposing a roundabout tomorrow. We're really kind of proposing a roundabout um, down the road as the traffic um, numbers grow, as we know they will with more housing out on Central Point and in the South End area and really out on uh, Leland and uh, off Myers as well. We know there's more growth opportunity out there. So as those numbers go up, we expect the justification for the roundabout to go up. <clears throat> but right now, people in the community that um, have concerns about it really kind of questioning whether or not they need, they don't see their, that intersection being that big of a problem right now, even though we hear a fair amount of complaints about Central Point Road and how that ties in. I think that's pretty well recognized. So. I think we've got some education work to do. We definitely want to make sure we've got strong justification for a roundabout. Um, I think over the years, the roundabout has just been something that's been uh, suggested and not necessarily justified in terms of warrants. So, you know, that's those are things to come. But I think that intersection, uh, everybody would agree it needs a solution beyond what's there now. And um, so 
a lot of good feedback there. And uh, like I said, our next plan we propose to take uh, and have an informative meeting with the Planning Commission on on the study, kind of like what we've done for you folks already. So I don't think you'll hear anything new at that Planning Commission meeting if you're you're on the Planning Commission, Bob. I think you're the only one on the Planning Commission. So you'll have to you'll get a repeat of what you, what we've been telling you. But um, so I think that is it on that particular yeah. update. Did anybody comment um, about continuing going <coughs> east all the way to Gaffney Lane instead of stopping at Moccasin? I don't remember those comments. We got a lot of, we, we gave the opportunity on the online survey to <coughs> provide written comments. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine 200 of those, and I think we asked two or three of those kind of open-ended questions. There's a bunch of comments on there. I read many of them. I, I, I think I read it when there was about 125 responses or so. So I haven't looked through the last 75, but generally no. <coughs> I mean, generally people are pretty, have you looked at them yeah, too? Yeah, I yeah. I mentioned it before that there's that one 50, 100 foot section that is, Yeah. there's nothing there and it just seems silly to, to me to go that far and then leave that Right at Gaffney section, Lane. Right yeah. at Gaffney yeah. Lane, yeah. So yeah. heading eastbound. There's always, there's always need to go further and further with well, project, the thing is, but, beyond yeah. that 100 foot section, it's all uh, bike lane all the way out to 213. So yep. you're coming all the way from. <laughs> I don't think we'll need the quarter study to fix that segment. I think we could almost do that in house. Okay. And so I think we'll be able to get there without that being in the quarter study. And will it include repaving the street? Uh, what? the Like along Lynn? Um, my sense is when we get there, we would have to do a fair amount of repaving. Uh, going down uh, Lynn on the, when you're going on the downhill side, mm -hmm. there are some, uh, in the bike lane, there are some, you know, and you're going 20, 25, sometimes 30 miles an hour down there when you're really hauling. And uh, there are some places that are... Um, need, uh, need some help? Some, some yeah, some... Paving? You know, where the concrete or the uh, pavement's all, all broken out and it's scary. So I usually get go actually go in the go in the in the car lane. I didn't know anybody went down on bikes at twenty five miles an hour on Lynn Avenue. Oh yeah. I didn't did know they put the brakes on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh yeah, well I don't know. It's, it's made of <laughs> and I'll come on that sign, I'll get twenty five, twenty eight usually. Hmm. Okay. Um, so if there's no more questions or comments about that, I, we've included in your um, packet here a flyer on the benefits of roundabout. And I just, since we're on, uh, since we're recording this, I thought I'd just talk about those benefits just to start this educational program a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and read some of this. Um, lives saved, up to 90% reduction in fatalities because of a roundabout, 76% 70 pr reduction in injury crashes, 30 to 40% reduction in pedestrian crashes. 75% fewer conflict points than a four-way intersection. This information, by the way, um, came from the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, so the Federal Highway Administration. So it's, I think it's uh, good information. We're not making up these facts. Um, roundabout can slow vehicles, so typically the, you know, a speed through a roundabout would be under 30 miles an hour. Don't give me ideas, Louise. <laughs> no roundabouts on Center Street. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> drivers have more time to re react to the other cars and pedestrians. Um, reduces the severity of crashes, keeps pedestrians safer. 30 to 50 percent increase in traffic capacity. So they, besides being safer, they generally move more traffic. I guess that was one comment that I really heard was if you're going to build a roundabout, build it right and build, make sure the lanes are wide enough to accommodate you know, the kind of traffic that's through there. Make sure, you know, a lot of people are saying if you're going to build it, build a two-lane roundabout, and this one's kind of a hybrid. It's got some sections of two lanes, some at one lane. That's a concept design as well. I guess I'd want to stress that. We're, we, haven't, we haven't narrowed our design yet, but build it right was a pretty big message that I heard at the, at the open house. Um, improved traffic flow for intersections that handle a high number of left turns. We do have a fair number of left turns at that location, so uh, reduced need for storage lanes. Um, some of the things that people don't always think about is the money saved because we don't have signal equipment to install or repair. You heard from the county, we pay them 
I don't remember averages per intersection, but we pay a fair amount each intersection that they have to maintain. On you know, we do that annually. Um, savings estimated uh, at an average of five thousand dollars per year in electric and maintenance cost. Service life of around about is twenty five years versus the ten year service life of signal equipment. I think both those are shy. I think if we're going to build a roundabout, it better last longer than twenty five years, and that's pretty true for I think signalized equipment too. So I'm not sure that I agree with that particular fact, but um, you know there's some aesthetic values to roundabouts, and they definitely do traffic calming. So once people get used to them, they're they are a much better facility, and. Um, if you've used them in, in uh, other countries. I guess our one problem might be that we um, probably have not, there's a lot of roundabouts out there that don't quite cut it, cut it right, with regard to the benefits or the design. So I, I really feel like if we're going to build a roundabout there, we need to build it right. Well, I think the one that, you, that we have now there by the 213 jog handle. handle, that seems work pretty good. <coughs> I think it works real well. I use it, I mean, I use it every day. Yeah. I don't know what I'd use the one at 32nd and Gleason and Portland as a model, though it's like dates from the 1940s. Yeah, most of the traffic engineers I've talked to don't call that a roundabout. When it's I was a, a kid, it was a roundabout. It, it, it was yeah. no stops. Yeah. 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 And it's, there were barely cars. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can remember using it without stops. All I had to do is watch out for the nuts. <laughs> I, I've got a quick question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John, um, so are you evaluating how much additional right-of-way might need to be acquired or easements because of some of the irregular lot alignment along the roads? And then might talk a little bit about access to that small shopping center there and the concerns that they had there for access yeah that's right you were there for a little while weren't you yeah, I was <laughs> yeah yeah so um, we had uh, we have looked at right-of-way acquisition and um, the the fact that the city's acquiring the school district property there helps a bunch because that's the biggest impact that to that corner there is we see that roundabout and try to place it in a way that doesn't necessarily impact to the to the degree we can avoid that small shopping center and um, their parking area, we move that towards the uh, school district, that annex building. In fact, part of it gets right up near that. And in, in, in again, in our concept design, also impacts the church corner, uh, which they we've talked to them. They have concerns about you know impacts to their signage and how their frontage looks as well. They feel like they have uh, an attractive corner right there, so they've got concerns about that. But we have talked to them, so there's impacts there. There's impacts on uh, the third corner, um, which is the paint shop. They actually get, well, they wouldn't get right away necessarily, but there'd be some space there that would probably be landscaped. And then the other one is at center, uh, uh, not, not center, but central point where the apartment complex is. There'd be some right away that would kind of, again, be essentially open space along their frontage. But the shopping center you're talking about, um, there is potential for some impact there. We're trying to minimize that, but their biggest impact is driveways and how people access that property. And uh, we think uh, what we've heard from the property owners, they're not excited about giving up any right away. And uh, they were actually at the meeting and had some, had some opinions to share about that. So uh, we definitely want to be aware of that and working with them. We'd prefer not to have to um, have a negative impact there. I think there's potential for improvements there, but we got to have a property owner that's willing to work with us. So. It's going to have some uh, long-range uh, land use implications in terms of zoning <coughs> when you deal with uh, an intersection. Everybody likes to <coughs> locate a Meyer Frank, or, or not a Meyer Frank, but a Fred Meyer, you know, at, a, at an intersection because they've got that, that exposure. <coughs> but in a roundabout, uh, access is going to be a change. Uh, be a consideration. So, so yeah, anything close to the intersection that's got a driveway is a problem because all of a sudden you've got to figure out how to, you know, those di di those medians, the splitter medians as you come into the intersection. If there's a driveway in that area, you know, a person can't turn left to get in that driveway, so they got to figure out another way to do that. So, still work to be done, but we're not talking about building around about, you know, even probably within the next five years. Um, 
but it'd be nice to confirm that that's the right solution for that and do that in this study. Any other questions about that? If, we're, if no one has questions, I did want to go back and make a comment about uh, the, um, I don't know what we're calling it, the South Corridor or uh, Lynn Avenue and all of that. Um, last night we had the, the Clackamas County uh, Pedestrian Bikeway um, Advisory Committee, and um, we were evaluating that the, there's like 12 corridors, and then within each corridor there are a number of routes. Well, that, co that route from 213 down to downtown uh, Oregon City uh, on Myers Road, Lynn, and all of that, that's actually on their uh, to-do list. And I, did, I was just curious. I said, well, from everything I understand, you know, Oregon City is going to be doing all that. And they were like, really? So I didn't know if, if Oregon City is coordinating with them. I haven't um, heard of that group, for one. So, no, we're not. I mean, okay, well, not that we don't want to, but if it's another group that you want to put us in touch with, we we'll want yeah. to make sure that they provide their opinion, maybe touch on our website. And mm -hmm. I told them to contact you. And uh, uh, Scott Holsher is the... Um, Active transportation. He's the one on the county staff. That so yeah, they had a whole chart set out and all the staging and what you know. So <laughs> that'd be interesting, interesting yeah. to hear what, they, what they're offering, especially if it's funding. Yeah, dollars next to each item, so it might be a help to Oregon City. Okay. I've got to ask a question. Are you folks having fun yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around. You're not required. To. <laughs> You, you can go home and watch the Kardashians if you want to. <laughs> I say you can go home and watch this. <laughs> sure. So um, the next item on the agenda is the Holcomb Boulevard School Zone. Um, so I'm recalling this. So if I miss something, uh, um, you'll have to forgive me. But so the the reason why. Holcomb doesn't have a school zone along that stretch is because there's no school property fronting Holcomb. Um, the access road is a is a public right of way that extends off of Holcomb back into the school district property. So the way state law is um, designates much. school zones is that it, that property has to actually be fronting the the roadway in which it's it's. Um, and that you're affecting, albeit that took me a little while to figure that out. We actually posted it, I'm going to say, four years ago. I might be off on my timeline, but we actually posted it. After the county, um, after we completed the sidewalk project up there and the city took over jurisdiction of Holcomb, you know, I said, well, let's post it. And we posted it as a school zone, and um, we... Uh, kind of came to the conclusion after working through it with our police department that we had improperly posted that school zone and they couldn't provide tickets for that so it was um, it was really our directive was to remove the school zone and um, and so I learned something about school zones at that particular point in time so it, but that it, it, it's not as if there's not a need there though John the, the, the danger of that curve and the proximity of that school and the congestion of those school buses and kids on foot and yada, 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 sort of, you know, aren't are we talking about a sort of a split in hairs and a technicality and all that kind of stuff? The need's still there. It is a technicality, but it's, it's an important one um, about how school zones are defined. I mean, there's, there's arguments to be made for school signage and um, things in a lot of places and that's why we look pretty closely to the definition of how to post those school zones. Something striking my memory cells, weak as they are, about off-site off, uh, off school crossings on school corridor routes as being, you know, eligible for some of this signage and controls. Well, Henry, I know the school zone posting laws have changed a lot. That's why I said I'm not, it's my memory cells. That are if you remember, there was about uh, three different changes to 
the wording of signage, when we can they, post every, them. Every legislative session they change. Yeah, they have kind of dialed that in. So I don't know, maybe it will change someday. But I don't disagree. It's a dangerous corner. It's got sight distance issues. The speed is really high as mm. traffic comes down the hill, most of which is not necessarily city traffic, although That's what I, think. I would argue that um, even um, parents dropping and we, we've monitored that driveway parents leaving and entering that school um, come at a pretty high clip so yeah even the know, parents huh? <clears throat> even the parents but um, you know I think there is provisions for you know more permanent speed zone signage along there it's something you know reminds you of how fast you're going something yeah. that, that there's opportunities for that um, coming out of there's a neighborhood just down the hill from the driveway there that's got a trail that allows access back to I'm trying to remember the name of the subdivision, but um, on the other side of Holcomb Boulevard there, and there is a good opportunity for a crossing there, but most parents wouldn't allow their, and I, I don't blame them, wouldn't allow their child to cross at that location. So yeah, um, yeah. I think we might have an opportunity for a, a pedestrian activated crossing right there, and our TSP would actually call for one. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I don't disagree with you. I just think, th don't think until legislature change how we define that yeah. school zone. Okay. We can't really yeah. post that as a school zone. Mr. Chairman, a quick question. So who owns the property that the school has their new sign on? It's right by the intersection there. Hmm. I, w I don't know. Well, that was funny. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, I think. Wasn't it? Well, I, I'm just saying whoever owns that property, um, you could probably create a flag lot to the school even if it's only five feet wide when it gets out to Holcomb the school would own property abutting Holcomb mm -hmm. so I'm you know a flag lot and again I don't know who owns that parcel that they have their new sign on I don't know if it's city right away or if somebody owns that that might be another way to meet the technicality of the law so you can sign the road John would it have to be a, a, a a, an actual flag lot, or could it be an easement? Just <clears throat> it probably have to be a lot. It has to be fee ownership, probably to be saying it's abutting it. I don't know, but that's another possibility. Yeah, you can well, check them out. I'll look. I don't know who owns it, or I don't really recall where their sign is, but I, I think it's on that area where the school bus bench is, right there, right in that area. Is that I'm, I'm, so, I'm kind so of forgetting where their sign if, is. It, the intersection of the road that comes from the school that comes from the north traveling south and intersects with Holcomb on the curve. Mm -hmm. It's the north west corner there. There's a, a, a sign, you know, and they just redid it. It's a very nice sign. A oh, triangle lot? Yeah, it's a triangle lot. Yeah, PTA did a big fundraiser for that. I think it's Clackamas County Housing Authority. Yeah. It's the school yeah, district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Launch the school district, he says. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to remember it, that it's not contiguous to their no, it's a schoolyard. Yeah, it's a Does segregated it have to be lot. contiguous? Yeah. But who, who, who did you say owns it? School, school district. School district. It's segregated from the um, the actual school property. property. Pro, uh, you know the, the proper um, of the uh, school. The site that the school is actually on. Yep. So if they consolidated the lots, would that accomplish that? There's no way of connecting that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. the school have any plans of doing something to that school? Or is it the school site? We're doing it? Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, not that I'm aware of. Bob might know a little bit more about it. sorry, does, I missed a question. Does the school district have any plans of doing anything different at that school? No. And actually, I was going to say that even if by some technicality, you were able to get the speed down to 20 miles an hour on Holcomb Boulevard there, you'd just be asking for a whole bunch of accidents. People would be coming roaring down Holcomb Boulevard. Rear the People would be slowing down to 20 miles an hour from, what is it, 40s. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, we have that in other places. It's just, you know, yeah, yeah, it, it needs to be it. signed right and probably flashing. You know, I mean, yeah. we need to see, I think, you know, Martin and I have talked about that. We'd always like to see through safe routes to school grants, funding of these flashing school zones, yeah. uh, flashing well, lights. Fifteen mile an hour <clears throat> flashing sign down at the bottom of the hill yeah. before you get to the curve. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. If you could have a flashing sign up near that school road, 
where yeah. it would make people aware that they're in a 40 mile an hour zone instead of 55 miles an hour coming down the hill. That might help. Yeah. Something like that. We definitely do things with regard to curve ahead kind of signage, um, pedestrians ahead. It's just, uh, and I think we have done a pretty good job of signing those things. It's just the users that use that, they use it every day, and yeah. they're, you know, they're, they lose they lose attention there. I, I come out on that road every day and start to go down that hill, and pretty soon I see somebody right on my rear end mm -hmm. that weren't there when I pulled out on Hulk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they come down pretty fast. But when you were a teenager, you probably went twice as fast. Exactly. Let's see. Next. Talk okay. in a roundabout there, John. <laughs> What's that? Put a roundabout there? That's cool, yeah. Okay, want to move on here? You have any more? Um, well, we put this on here. I, I can't remember if this came up through the committee, but there's this ODOT, this idea of an ODOT bridge. Um, and that might be donated for the Portland oh, yeah. Trolley Trail or the the bridge that Martin just so um, graciously worked with UP to remove. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll, I can't, I don't remember if this actually came up. Was that in the meeting notes yeah. before? Yeah. So somebody brought that up. Lane did. Um, yeah, Lane. Lane brought it up and then the next day there was actually an article in mm -hmm. the, um, Oregon City News in regards to it. So they're yeah. watching. So I think that there's still some desire. I know Metro is pretty interested in seeing the trolley trail continue all the way into Oregon City. Um, we have not yet had any conversations with Metro or the state about you know what they're thinking there, um, nor has the city of Gladstone. So I, I just think it's a concept. There's still um, some grant funding. There's like $225,000 that the city of Gladstone and Metro applied for. And it's there's I think they're still wondering how best to pursue that idea. Um, Is that of the a, same money that was from the flex funding? Yeah, yeah. Same, same funding. So they, they would still have access to that. And I think they've just heard from ODOT that they do have some spare bridges lying around somewhere, which it may be bridge beams. I'm thinking more like bridge beams, but um, that's, you know, that's about all we know. It's a big span. Pretty big span. Yeah, it'd be a big span. It seemed that, that you'd have, you'd have to finish with the Lake Oswego water pump system there first, because that, it's that case on that, I guess, or what do they call that? A uh, Coffer Dam. Dam. I can never yeah. remember that, but uh, yeah, I guess that's causing it caused all the problems because it was uh, a square and the, the way the river hits that and swirls and anyway. Um, so anyway, that's all I had to report on that. Really, it was just kind of it was in the notes, and we thought maybe we better address it. And we haven't heard much there, but there's potential. Um, our main concern with that, and I guess one other, our main concern with that is maintenance dollars and who's going to maintain that facility. Mm -hmm. We've also heard that um, uh, there's a need for a pipeline that uh, the county and water environment services would um, own and operate uh, to get wastewater from the Kellogg wastewater treatment plant onto our side of the river, the treatment plant, the Tri City treatment plant. So there may be some opportunities there. Um, they could no. always pour under the river. They could always pour under the river with something like that <laughs> as well. So, um, I've got summer construction updates. Uh, given the time, is there anything in particular? I would say all of our summer construction projects are moving along as planned. We're getting good bids for various work. Glory Seal is going to start soon. One day. Our um, pavement maintenance projects are going to start soon. Claremont. Uh, and the water line and the work on Claremont's going to start soon. McLaughlin Boulevard Phase 2 is moving ahead uh, as planned. So generally, I think our construction projects are moving as planned. But if you've got specific questions, I'd be happy to answer. When is McLaughlin due to be finished? McLaughlin's scheduled throughout um, the year, and I suspect it'll be complete before Christmas. Um, so the end this of year? the end of this year. Yeah. Wow. Okay. 
Okay. With that, that's all I have. Okay. We've included some information in the packet, but uh, that's just really information for you to take a look at. I saw the speed stuff. You guys had asked for the speed data mm -hmm. from our um, speed detectors that we have located throughout the city. So we currently have six speed detectors in our inventory. Um, only three of them are capable of providing download data. And two of them provide you good information. The other one provides you a, a, a comma delineated Excel spreadsheet that you have to um, piece through and try and put the information together yourself. So, Which one is that? Um, it's the one that. First one? Uh, it's the one that was located at High Street. And it's still currently located at that location. So, the data that we gave you there. Um, basically is just uh, vehicle counts. Um, the way that this system works there, it gives you a uh, number of vehicles per 30 minute interval. Okay, so you don't get true time data on the exact time a vehicle was picked up and then the, the full tracking for that. Whereas the newer speed signs do provide you that information. And from that, you're, you can much easier, it's much easier to derive what's the 85th percentile for that particular um, speed location. Um, for this, the only thing I can generally um, extrapolate for you is what is the average um, speed along that area. Um, it is useful and we're providing this information to our friends at the PD because the, <laughs> the yellow line at the bottom tells you the number of violators and the general time period that those are occurring and our friends at traffic control are going to find out when's the best time to put up your trap. Um, <laughs> sure. So we'll be providing that to them. That's how you get Will we be able to get that information? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it looks like, looks like noon is a good time. Yeah, if you picked up on that. Yeah. yeah. That's how you do that, huh? So um, that, that's used, again, there's a lot of information here that if you can pull it down and take a look at it, it, it saves the city some time because we don't put a police officer out there when you don't need one. Right. That's great. Um, so you've got that information. The green line tells you what are the peak speeds, so across that half hour interval, how many cars came through there and what were the peak speeds on average going through there. Mm. Missing Speed? a matrix there? Is there the scale is it's a multi-scale because you got three different graphs going on there. Yeah. So depending on what you're looking at, it will reflect as to what the value is. So the numbers off the side there on the x-axis don't why? On the the x-axis is giving you the general um, time frame. The dates are across the top. I couldn't fit them in there. It was too cluttered. So the dates are June 3rd through June 15th. All of the times start at 0, 0, 100 and uh, move into 2400. Scale on the right hand side, it's a multi-scale, so it's dependent on which of the line chart, line graphs you're looking at. So the yellow, um, that is number of violators, and that's telling you how many violators at each half hour interval are crossing through there. When you look at green, it's reflective to um, miles per hour. So um, peak speed going through there, the multi-axis uh, multi will tell you average speed going through there from everything that was recorded across that time period, 31 miles an hour. Posted speed limit's 25. With a peak okay. of around 40. Yeah. The um, vehicle counts are just giving you an idea of how many vehicles you have traversing through there at a particular half hour period. Okay. Indy 500. So the the peak speed that you got in there was around noon on um, looks like June 6th or 7th, and somebody decided I'm going to try and get to 55 on this 25 mile an hour road. So this is one, like I said, it's a data delineate, delineated um, drawdown and then you got to feed it all into Excel and get what you want out of it. The other graphs that you see, these are the newer um, charts that are the newer um, speed detectors that we're purchasing. We have two of these in our inventory and we're purchasing another one after the new fiscal year rolls out. And that's something we'll talk to you guys in the fall as to where does where does the city recommend we put it? And then we'll talk to you guys and saying, tack, do you agree? This um, isn't a permanent one, though. No. It's a mobile one. That's something we can discuss, whether Aren't we decide to do a permanent or a mobile. On, on this high street one, mm -hmm. you said that was, was that the sixth or seventh that that speed was there? Uh, approximately around that time. Mm -hmm. Was there that, an accident or something? I think that was the day there? Oregon City might have responded to the shooting out at Reynolds High School. 
I doubt it. I don't believe we had any of our officers out in that jurisdiction. There was a couple of them that went down there mighty quick about that time of the day. Okay. Um, the other I two reports them. that I gave you are for Kanema and the Holcomb uh, Boulevard. So I gave you just some general maps, so if you're not familiar with where these are located, you can go and take a look at, at these. Um, the Kanema report, really, we fine-tuned that one. The Holcomb report, um, I think Jason, when he pulled this down, there was an error because it's showing the 85th percentile as 41 miles an hour. But when you look at the data, it's not indicative of that. So I've, I've got to look at that. showing it was captured during 2001. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a brand new one, um, and we just pulled it off this yeah. morning. So um, I didn't get a chance to proof it before we brought it over to you guys. Um, the so, Kanema data, so that's a little bit more representative of what we can do with this. This one I was able to play with for a few days before we gave it to John last month. Um, and from that, you can see what's the 95th percentile, the 85th percentile, what's the mean. So what's everybody, you know, the average driver coming through there, posted speed. This is what our product that we're hoping to push out with each of these data dumps when we relocate these every quarter is we're going to be able to pull this report and then we're going to disseminate it to the PD and anybody else that wants it. They'll be useful for instances where someone comes in and says, you know, everybody's driving like a bat out of hell out of Center Street. Okay, well, according to the data, you know, this is <laughs> what's what's actually occurring out on there. So the Kanema, um one is, is a very good example of just that. We're receiving reports that everybody's you know, speeding through the area. Well, the data that we have shows that the mean, the average speed is 16 miles an hour. And your 85th percentile, which is where you're trying to set your, your posted speed limit at, is perfect. So it's 22 miles an hour is um, the 85th percentile. Yeah. Perception's everything. Yeah. No, I think he's going to mark your one on Colcom Boulevard, though, is I wish I guess. very misplaced, very for this. this is misinformation here. Okay. Because it is posted right by Steve's Market. And people will be slowing down coming to that that uh, sign there to pull into the market. Mm -hmm. And also it will be recording people coming out of the argument, out of the market. So when I looked at that I thought this can't <coughs> be right. Okay. And I think that's a big well, factor. That's, that's about where I hit the brakes to hit get, get into that corner going in, going down onto Redwood mm -hmm. Road too. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things that we can do is, is reevaluate some of the um, locations. If it's not a permanently mounted um, facility, we have the capability of potentially relocating it. I can't promise it for every location because you guys might say, oh, "I think it's better here," and I don't have the appropriate amount of sunlight to keep that system up and running. Uh, for permanently mounted facilities, yeah, it runs 24-7, you have no problems, but can I get electricity out there to it? Um, it becomes a little bit more logistically um, complicated. I mean, I use the Holcomb mm -hmm. quite often. I mean, to calibrate your uh, speedometer? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just see that people drive there pretty fast, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, yeah. Well, the but, other thing I would say, Bob, is the number of number of cars that use Steve's Market compared to the overall number of vehicles coming down Holcomb or up Holcomb is probably pretty small. So we're not, I mean, these, this, this information is, is, is not science necessarily. It's good information to have, but it's not going to, it's more about looking at averages, really. And if it could be moved up closer to the school and shot again and it shows the same layout, then that sort of buttresses the opinion that perhaps perceptions off of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the one thing to take a look at this is the amount of data captures that you have on these new ones because it, it shows you a, a um, rolling average mm -hmm. for all of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. So it'll shoot a particular vehicle several times as it's crossing through there. Um, so you start weeding out some of these. I'm, I'm transitioning into the market or I'm pulling out of the market. Um, so the, the law of averages starts to show you the, the picture of what the speed down that road um, truly is. Well, we could criticize any, anything yeah. after yeah. death. Uh, and we do. Like in that case, the car pulling into Steve's there would delay maybe four or five cars behind it. Yep. You know, so we could overanalyze yep. just about anything we wanted. To. Oh, yeah, the speed limit, it's, um, I forgot to check what the posted speed limit on Holcomb is. What's it? 40. 40? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we'll revalidate this and um, 
I'll uh, figure out what the actual 85th percentile on this is. The computer is supposed to calculate it, but I think Jason moved it manually. So I've got to redo this one. Um, we relocate these every quarter, and I'll bring you guys updates every time we relocate them. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yep. Good. Okay. Uh, did we do the bike tourism stats? Uh, I think these were informational pieces okay. more than anything. Um, so, yeah, I, I hadn't intended to do a okay. full report. I guess the only thing that I would add is um, there's a couple letters at the back end of the package that I think are pretty in, um, telling with regard to the state of federal funding of projects, and so those might be of interest to you. We've got a couple articles that came out of the Washington Post as well that just show how we've been kicking the can down the road quite a while for, with regard to gas taxes and, um, you know, this whole idea of voting for funding for a uh, Street maintenance is, is a, you know, it's interesting. There's clearly not much leadership there when it comes to how to take care of maintenance if you think, you know, a vote of the people is the way to get there. Uh, I agree, though, that we have to be on, we need to be, as, you know, managers of that funding, we definitely need to be um, accountable for that. So I think, you know, annual reports and, you know, small town is a lot easier to manage than Clackamas County with the miles and miles of roadway that they have. So they're 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 in a difficult position, but um, there's, there can still be accountability there, I think. So, um, but you know, you got to have leadership to be able to get there, and you got to have uh, you got to be you know a track record of success. I think if you don't, then it gets scrutinized pretty often. So. And with that, are we still going to try and watch the video? If you want. I mean, it just depends on what... what it's a... It's, I can't remember. It's like a six-minute video. Seven. Seven minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. you, you had sent out an email regarding the location of the post office box. It came late this afternoon. I got it. Are you going to be talking about that, or can that wait? Um, I don't remember the details there. Do you? It's the cluster mailbox <coughs> at uh, Partlow Road, and Kathy received a response from um, Oregon City Post Office about why they can't move that mailbox. Or why they'd rather not. The yeah, gentleman why they'd to rather not. The crosswalk yeah, asked if uh, we could reposition that. Yeah, so there was a, oh, looky there. Um, there was, yeah, that was a customer concern, or a citizen concern. Two yeah. citizen concerns, apparently. Two. Yeah. According and to and um, so we, we looked into that, talked to the uh, post office about their deliveries and whether there was an option there. And, um, I thought their response was, was actually, I, I, I haven't read it, but well, I talked to Kathy a little bit about it um, this, this morning. Um, I kind of I kind of agreed with their response. Look at this, or? No, go, I mean, I, it was just basically that they're concerned for left turns and they're concerned for efficiency and delivery. Uh, those were a couple of things that well, I heard. The man and then, who created the subdivision asked to have it on the south side initially. Yeah. That was he asked for that. Um, but there was precedence. There, the, the, all the other mailboxes along yep. Partlow Road are on that side. So every, every resident that's on the north side of Partlow Road has to cross Partlow Road to get to their mailbox. So these these customers aren't any different. So it seems like the post office thought this through and, and their logic still works. Um, is there more, is there more email, well, John, that I should go over? I think that's the, yeah. the primary. Mm -hmm. So do we have any responsibility to getting back to the two citizens who brought this issue to the TAC? Yes. And have we gotten back to them? Not yet. Um, Kathy has their information, and That's so fine. she'll pass it along to me, and I hope to do that tomorrow. So. Reasonable. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm not finding that here. Did we already have that loaded? Yeah, up? go to Chrome. It's, it's on YouTube. So if you go to Chrome, it'll be the second tab at the top, very top. It says Communications Powered. Yeah. And I can just give a quick... Wanna, um, yeah. Tourism in, in uh, for cycle tourism in Oregon is $400 million a year, a little over a million dollars uh, a day. 
Um, and uh, Travel Oregon came to, to our shop and uh, for Sea Cycles there and um, asked if we wanted to participate in a video production. So we were um, interviewed down at the, uh, uh, well, we were just interviewed. And then um, <coughs> many other people were interviewed as well. Um, and then a couple of the staff that went up to uh, Newell Creek Canyon and did some writing there and they filmed some of that. So you'll see our shop, you'll see our, uh, some of our staff. And um, so basically this video will be used to promote uh, not only within our state, but throughout the neighboring states. And uh, so you'll notice on the opening when, when uh, he clicks the opening, there's a, a, a frame of Oregon and they named two or three things and then it says or uh, first city cycle so that's pretty cool visitors, but primarily we want to focus on cycle tourism. 
We also are working on developing the Mule Creek Canyon to turn that into a trail system with a single track mountain bike trails there. We expect to draw between 50 and 100,000 mountain bike tourists there per year. Mm. Bicycle tourism provides $400 million to the state economy. That's just the tourism part. The industry side, that study came in at over $400 million. So in Oregon, we're approaching a billion dollar bike business. New dollars coming, helps the small communities. Every time bicycles goes into a cafe, lodging, anything that they do over there, it's going to benefit our local communities. And cycling is just a tool. It's a vehicle for experiencing the world. If your community is looking to start something to bring tours in, focus on what you have. Focus on what you love sharing about the area. Promote your assets. Capitalize on those assets. And make sure if you've got scenic attractions that you're calling them out. The most important asset is just to have a smile on your face and be welcoming. It's the most important thing you'll do. Open up your homes and businesses to bicyclists. You can't just sit here and hope the phone's going to ring or hope that Travel Oregon is going to promote you. you got to make it work and you have to go for it. If you have to drive and you really want it to work, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so I have a question about Mule Creek. I mean, isn't that kind of metro? I mean, I, isn't metro doing some planning? I mean, is that even going to be mountain biking, biking the wild in there? Or I mean, sorry, I, I'm having a hard time hearing the. Sorry. Let's see. That's good, Martin. Hit pause. So, so the mountain biking in the Newell Creek, is that even allowed? Um, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> there, there's a planning process going on right now for, for public meetings between here and the end of uh, October of this year. Um, and I would say this, that uh, Dave Elkin, who's doing a really great job of leadership, um, of course, they're very careful, but but you know, he has stated on several occasions that mountain biking will be part of that. What, how much is going to be separately designated? How much will be shared use? How extensive the trail system will be? All of those things are up uh, to you know the planning process. I, they have the International Mountain Biking association is involved in the planning process so that's a very well respected uh, organization national organization um, and so they they have you know just very good at the science of trail building so um, the, the important thing is that whatever whatever trail systems are built there uh, that they are done uh, to <coughs> complement and ensure that we preserve and protect the, the environment there, so it is a watershed area, so um, so those will all be taken into consideration. So I know also we're also talking about a multi-use path that'll be on the east side of the <coughs> highway. Um, that's probably down the road quite a ways. So that'll be a huge project. So, okay. Passenger rail is that? Information or yeah, those are all information. The rest of them are they all just information? Yeah. And uh, any future agen uh, agenda items? Uh, are we going to have a meeting next month, or are we going to? So typically, we take do a, take a break uh, because of the summertime and the busy schedules for two months. Um, and I would advocate for that, but it's not my call. It's up to you guys. I'd go. Uh, Just gone blank. <laughs> I would move that we adjourn for July and August. Second. Your second? Second. July oh, and August. Take two months off? Yes. We have that little to do. <laughs>
by that time, John will have a big report for us. Yeah. If something comes up, we can always have a special meeting. Want to put Call a question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. <laughs> Nay, I, I feel awkward just taking the time off, but I would, I would feel comfortable if, I would feel more comfortable if I knew that we could call a session if something did come up that we needed, that needed our attention. Let's and put a motion on the floor. And well, if that could be part of that, if, if you'd accept that as a friendly amendment to the motion, that if, if something comes up that requires our attention, that we could still meet. What do you, uh, just give me a sense of requires your attention. That could be different to every particular person. So I, I, I just, you know, if one of the members suggests that we really should meet to talk about that, is that that's kind of where you're at? Well, you could review it with the chairman of the commission and yep. between yep. staff and the I, chair my, figure it yeah, out. That that could work. I'm most of the time in town. <clears throat> then not too hard to get a hold of me. Say it again. I'll agree with yeah. you contacting me here yeah. and we'll find out. That's fine. Okay. Sure. Anything else? If anybody yeah, wants sorry, to get together for uh, coffee or beer uh, <laughs> in talk traffic, uh, I'm open. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. shop. One more thing, I've, <laughs> I've uh, officially announced my candidacy for mayor and I've registered for the, for the state and for the city last week, so we've taken the big jump, so that's it. So we might have an opening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I haven't thought about that. Mm. Yeah. Well, we, have, we have somebody who might be able to fill it. She was right here. Yeah. 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 You, you can't do both? What's up with that? Well, you can point to yourself. Today's meeting with me today. No, I could. Oh, point yourself. Yeah. Okay. I'm I guess here. I want to thank Lisa. She got through. Uh, she did her good. Hey, first yeah, solo yeah. meeting. Did a good job. Screened up and down. Screened up and down. And. Down and, and